We are coming up on that seven o'clock start time. I'd like to welcome you to this virtual Board of Education meeting. Attending a virtual meeting may be a new experience for some. So please allow me to take a moment to review some procedures that will allow everyone to be able to participate. When speaking, please state your name, address and topic before beginning your comments. Some meeting participants are joining by telephone and cannot see the face or name of the speaker as shown on a computer screen. The public participation at board meetings as per bylaw 0167.3 applies to this virtual meeting as well. Please mute your phone or computer microphone to prevent feedback and background noise during times when you are not speaking. There is a chat box found in the upper right hand corner of your screen. The chat box may be used to pose a question. The name or telephone number of the person posting the chat comment will appear on the screen. The board president will read the question aloud during the appropriate section of the meeting for the guests calling in by telephone. This meeting has an opportunity for public comment under item number 10 on the agenda. If you would like to register to make comments during this meeting, please type your name, address, and topic in the chat box at this time. All Board of Education votes will be conducted through a roll call vote, and the meeting will be recorded. The recording includes anything typed into the chat box. At this time, I'll call upon President Johnson to bring the meeting to order. Thank you, Dr. Opper. We will come to order. The Manila Board of Education exists to lead and serve to support the education of all students focused on developing policies, retaining highly effective staff, acting on behalf of the community, and ensuring the sustainability of the district through open and clear communication. Please rise for the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. All right. Mrs. Peck, if you could please call the roll. Mr. Seeger? Mr. Here. Forbes? Here. Mr. Holmes? Here. Hold on. I heard two here's. Who am I? I didn't hear who it was. Mr. Seeger? Mr. Forbes? Here. Mr. Holman? Here. Mr. Scheller? I think we lost him somewhere. I saw him on. Uh, Mrs. Petke here. Mr. Johnson. Here. Mrs. Johnson. Here. 
All right, Dr. Opper, can you verify publication of meeting? Uh, yes, it was. Thank you. All right, presentations. Item one, District Reading Specialist Annual Literacy Report. Mrs. Cernal, please. Hey, that's me. Dr. Opper, are you, sh am I sharing my screen or are you? Um, you can go ahead and share your screen. I just stopped sharing. Okay, I will see if I can figure out how to do that. It's been a while. Let's see. Um, let me know if you see it. Not just we yet. Um, on the toolbar, did you click twice, once to choose which screen and then another time to share? I believe, but I'll try it again. How about now? Yes. It's coming Yay. up. All right. All right. Well, I won't take long because I know we have a big agenda tonight. And to be honest, I don't have a whole lot of data to share with you since, well, we didn't have assessments in the spring. So I will share with you what I know and we'll go from there. So the big question, how are our students doing with literacy? And the answer is, wouldn't we like to know? <laughs> um, we really need to find out, and, and that's the best answer we can give. So at the elementary school, one of the things that we will do immediately is um, our baseline assessment, which is Fondus and Pinnell, and it's a running record. So if, you, if you're not familiar with the running record, uh, the teacher and the student um, are face-to-face. -face. The student reads to the teacher. The teacher is listening for accuracy along with um, fluency and comprehension. And we sort of get a sense of where they're at. So that'll be one of the first things we do. Um, when we think about what we did in the spring, well, what, number one, we had to choose essential standards to continue instruction. So we knew literacy wasn't going to fall by the wayside. So all of our teachers chose the essential standards. They really honed in on what they knew they had to get through for the end of the year. And we just made sure students had books in their hands. And that's one thing I'm really proud of because whether it was the elementary school or the high school, our kids were reading and they were reading articles and still getting books coming to them through the mail. And I think we did a pretty good job with what we had. Um, we know there's a skill performance slide that's likely. Usually we talk about, usually I would talk about the summer slide this time of year, but we have way more than a summer slide going on. We have a spring and summer slide. So we understand that and we're ready for it. We're sort of um, coordinating our efforts, trying to figure out how we're going to attack it. Um, one thing that we've talked about um, is doing a flash forward and a flash back type of event. So it's, it's protocol. So you would get your people together, um, the grade level um, ahead and the grade level behind and sort of have a discussion with where your kids ended, where mm -hmm. they need to go. So that's something we're looking at doing in the beginning as well. So this is a slide I always show. This is just like a permanent slide in my slideshow because this is what we use, the workshop model. It's going to look different. And so that's really what I've been working on is um, no matter what type of, in, you know, whether we're face to face or whether we're synchronous learning, we need to figure out what our workshop model is going to look like. So this is what a typical workshop would look like. The teacher would give about a 10 to 15 minute mini lesson. There'd be some independent time. They would check in midway through. They would pull some small groups and then we'd wrap it up with a share. So one thing we're sort of tossing around is if we can't, um, safely do small group work, which we hope we can. Um, but if we can't, one of the things that we had talked about is getting our students familiar with using a Google Meet. So a lot like we're doing right now, students would have an opportunity to work with partners, small groups, or even a Google Meet with their teacher for conferring. Um, not only would that allow safety, but it would also get them used to doing something like that um, on the computer, which is something we didn't have the opportunity to really teach before we left last spring. 
What else can we do? This is just a continuation of things that are happening. So continued emphasis on literacy coaching. It, it's not going to go away. It's still a top priority in our district. Continued intervention work. Um, for me, weekly literacy grade level team meetings to make sure everybody's on track. Um, professional development in our Lucy Culkins phonics. We now have the phonics curriculum um, grades K through two. Collecting more data as always, continue focus on preparing students for the ACT, and then just always trying to figure out the why. We always are, are questioning and digging deeper. Same slide I hit in last year because I was super excited at what's coming up. I didn't lie to you. It said, hold tight, good things are coming, and good things are coming. So here it is. This is some good news. Um, one of the few tests we have to show you is ACT scores. Um, so if you can check out 2019-2020, you can see we have bounced back, people. Um, so 2017, we were at a 19.4. We dropped quite a bit last year, and we have bounced back just right under the state average. So to me, that's success, especially knowing what kind of year it was. Um, one of my favorite slides right here is the fact that there are some really key areas in literacy that we are pulling ahead of the state. This one in particular, the knowledge of language, we were at 72 and the state's back here at 48. Um, same with integration of knowledge and ideas. So there's some really, um, some really positive things that are happening with our ECT scores, which is huge, but my favorite what excites me the most is this one. So I have been in the district for, this is year 20 for me, and in 20 years, at least to my knowledge, I have never seen us above state average for writing scores, and that is huge. Um, writing's tough, it's a tough thing to teach, it's tough for our kids. So the fact that we are actually ranking above state average for writing is pretty exciting. And I like to end with, we don't really know a whole lot. We really don't. But here's what we know. We will find them and we will teach them. I will find you and I will teach you. So no matter what, um, we are going to obviously continue to strive for the best instruction we can give. And that's all I have. Do you have any questions for me? I'm going to stop sharing so I can maybe see your face. There we go. No? Awesome. Thank you very much, Mrs. Cerno. Thank you. All right, next we have our uh, key performance indicators, our principal conduct reports, and uh, Mr. Wolfgram and Ms. Brower are both out on vacation this week, but uh, Dr. Opper, you do have their information. Um, yes, yeah, so this is the time of the year when we take a look at the summary of um, conduct. Um, you're looking particularly for um, the more dangerous um, type conduct and, and looking to see a decline in that. Um, we've had fairly consistent low numbers across the board. Uh, so first you see Ms. Brower's report. And then following that in the packet would be Mr. Wolfgram's report. Um, I'm happy to take down any questions that you might have or any follow-up that you'd like to receive from them next month. I'm going to go with there must not be any. So thank you, Dr. Opper. Thank you. All right, Huffman Planning and Design Project Update with Mr. McGregor and or Ms. Beck. I saw Ms. Beck um, get online. Um, Mackenzie, are you there? And are you reporting this evening? Or is, is that going to be a wait for, for Mr. McGregor to come on? Um, I am reporting tonight, but I think Matt did want to be here to add something to it if he needed to. So if we could wait for him, that'd be great. All right. I'm always good at filling space, so we'll just 
if it's okay, I will go back to sharing and I will go ahead and um, present the next item, if that is okay with you, President Johnson. Yes. All right, so um, we have had a, a very diverse committee meeting for the past uh, four Mondays. And I really thank the group for um, their commitment to um, giving up these beautiful Monday evenings that we've had in the past few weeks to get together and share the viewpoints of what's happening in the community, um, the opinions of our citizenry about reopening of schools this fall. Um, so I will take you through um, what we have. And so this is the charge of the committee. And unlike some of the committees that we've had in the past, um, this committee was not charged to reach consensus or to agree to all elements of a plan. Um, we did ask them to be the conduit to the community, to be the ears, the eyes, and gauge the public response to the plan as it was starting to unfold over the past several weeks. Um, we asked the committee members to listen and report back on parental concerns. Um, make sure we're thinking of everything. Um, so ensuring that all facets of the plan were as safe as possible and that we hadn't forgotten anything. And then also to assist with public relations and communications. Um, getting the word out in any means possible. Sometimes word of mouth is the best approach to that. Uh, so here you see a list of all of the different people that participated. Um, you can see how diverse the group is. Everything from our medical advisor and um, the Cobison um, terminal manager here in town to a wide array of parents and family members in addition to our staff. So um, many different viewpoints being represented by this group. And again, I'm thankful for each and every one to dedicate the time that they did for them. <clears throat> our primary goal all along was a commitment to high quality education while trying to mitigate the risk of the spread of COVID-19. So the primary goal of the board tonight would be to provide feedback and um, ultimately provide an approval of the reopening plan. Um, we invite conversation, uh, debate, um, and editing of the plan as we go along uh, in the hopes that there's something at the end that you are prepared to approve. So across the county, we've been meeting on Mondays with the Wapaka County Department of uh, Health Services, as well as all the county superintendents. And occasionally we have guests join us from um, other counties, uh, superintendents and our nurses. Um, we came up with three levels of risk. Um, currently, we're in the orange column, the moderate to high risk category for Wapaka County. As of this morning, uh, Mr. Wout uh, indicates that across the county, the southern part of the county where we have our larger communities, um, we have the largest incident rate of people testing positive for COVID-19 but that all communities across the county have been affected to include Manawa. Uh, so we are currently in the orange uh, column. And so what you see reflected tonight is what is best recommended by our medical advisor, um, the Wapaka County Department of Health, the CDC, um, the Nurses Association statewide, 
um, as well as uh, statewide DHS. Um, lower risk or that yellow column would be something we could go to if we see a steep decline, um, perhaps after a vaccine and um, the outbreak starts to flatten the curve and or we see a situation where there's a declining number of, of people um, actively having COVID-19, we might be able to move into the yellow zone, which would be gradually moving more and more toward what you might have expected last fall um, 2019. And then if things were to uh, become increasingly worse, um, school closure would be the next step, which for us would mean um, online synchronous learning for our students. So what our task was um, from the administrative perspective was to try to reopen and provide an in-person instructional option for parents. Um, that was probably the most frequently noted item in the parent survey. Um, but we also had to make adjustments accordingly as risk levels would change. So we're offering at this time three parent choices. Uh, we're hoping within the next couple of weeks to be able to survey parents and get their um, intentions on these three choices. One would be the in-person classroom instruction. For students in 4K through 8, that would be five days of instruction a week. And I should qualify that 4K still has the AM and PM program with the Wednesday family connection time, but it still is considered to be a five day a week uh, program. With high school, we would be looking at an AB on alternating days uh, schedule. This came up just today from the perspective with DHS that um, with the rising number of cases across the county and a spike uh, expected to occur somewhere in September and October, perhaps even extending into November, that if we could not maintain cohorts in high school classrooms, that we at least needed to reduce the number of students physically in the building. Um, so Mr. Wolfgram previously had talked about an alternating day. So Monday, Wednesday, Friday for one group, Tuesday, Thursday, and then the next week having that switched. Um, along with having a modified bell schedule so that we don't have uh, students that do need to go to different classrooms all passing in the hallway at the same time. And again, physical distancing and or face covering as is appropriate. And you'll see we detailed that out a little bit later in the, the presentation. Uh, synchronous learning is the next option. Uh, that's live real time online instruction. Some people still call that virtual. Uh, we wanted to choose a slightly different name because in the spring of last year, we did virtual instruction, but it was not live real time. So we wanted to make a distinction about what we intend to do um, as an offering. That would include uh, what Mr. Cobarubia showed me today, um, a lanyard much like the one I often wear uh, would have a microphone attached to it so that when the teacher is speaking, um, the teacher's voice would be clear and you wouldn't hear any other um, distracting noises that might be going on in the classroom uh, while the teacher is providing a live lesson. Um, there would be daily or in the case of high school hourly attendance. And then finally, we would have blended instruction um, this would offer the parent a combination of in-person and synchronous. So you could imagine, for example, a parent who wants their child to uh, do online learning most of the time, but perhaps they're taking welding. So they would come in and work in the welding booth um, during welding class, but would take their other courses online. 
or in the case of a student with a serious health condition, they may not be able to be live online throughout the entire day, um, but might do some synchronous classes and some they might watch the recorded lessons at other times of the day uh, because perhaps they need to rest during the day. Uh, the blended model would have a written plan and you saw an example of uh, what a, a written plan might look like. The form for that was included in the board packet. So the building consultation team would meet, um, everyone would agree to the appropriate plan for the student and then you would sign off on that um, as a school. Any questions so far? At any point, if you have a question, board members, please feel free to stop me. It might be helpful to talk about things in real time. So we're using the word cohort quite frequently in this presentation, so we thought it would be helpful to offer a definition. This is when students are grouped consistently throughout the day and if there is any switching to be done, it would be the teachers coming to the cohort. Um, students with specialized needs would have their uniquely written plans or IEPs as, as one might expect. Uh, so that's how um, special groupings would be addressed. You'll also see a slide on that with a little bit more detail coming up. Um, Manila elementary school students would be grouped by homeroom uh, the middle school students would be grouped by homerooms with most of the day with some of the specialized courses listed, um, such as band, choir, physical education, robotics, um, might be moving as a cohort to other spaces. For example, um, I can envision physical education taking advantage of the new fitness center, um, lots of bright natural light coming into that space, all new equipment. Um, so there you might um, move to that space with proper uh, sanitizing or disinfecting in between uses. Um, band and choir, we have to be sensitive to the, the way that um, this virus spreads through droplets or particulates in the air. So we need distancing that's more than six feet. In fact, some um, music researchers that are doing a study right now say it, it's at least 10 feet. So we're looking into how we're going to offer these other opportunities, but mitigate the risks, um, even though we might be moving to a slightly different environment. In the middle school, when students enter, they're going to go right to the middle school suite in their first hour class. Um, and then um, when they need to travel, for example, we aren't going to have all students traveling in the hallway at the same time. Um, middle school students would travel on a different, slightly different bell schedule than the high school students that are in the building. Again, reducing uh, number of people in the corridors. Um, We've removed a lot of the furnishings from the rooms, tried to simplify things so that you can physically distance um, the desks. In science classes, um, we're gonna dress like a scientist. This is nothing new. Students have worn goggles for years, not necessarily masks, but if students are gonna be in close proximity to one another, uh, working together on a lab experiment, they will be wearing uh, lab coats when appropriate, goggles, masks, and potentially even gloves, depending on what products they're working with. And there would be uh, disinfecting uh, protocols that would happen during any passing times. Um, the suggestion from the CDC is hand wash or sanitize roughly once an hour. So it might be between classes, might be the natural time to do that when students might be using the restrooms anyway. Um, so inside our new middle school space, they have their own set of restrooms, uh, which helps this process along. Students would keep their backpacks in the classroom, um, probably hanging on the back of their chairs. Um, so some people have talked about the safety of having backpacks in classrooms. 
um, everything they need is going to be in their backpack. It's one way teachers can make sure that what students need at home is in the backpack and headed home. The second thing is those backpacks are going to be open and actively used throughout the day. So concealing of things that might be alarming, weapons, drugs, it's going to be hard to conceal those things because teachers are going to be actively walking around students and students are going to be um, taking Chromebooks in and out, textbooks in and out all throughout the day. So um, those um, backpacks are going to be easily visible. And staggered dismissal at the end of the day, we talked with Cobison about loading one bus at a time um, to minimize the number of people again um, in the corridors and lunch delivered to students in the classroom. At the high school level, um, this slide was just changed today to reflect cohort A and cohort B on an alternating day schedule. Closed campus uh, will be the policy this year um, because we are accountable as a district for cohort um, tracing and contact tracing throughout the day. Uh, so we need to know where the students are during the time we're responsible for them. Um, students supervised in passing time, so no lingering. Many of the same protocols you saw in the previous slide. And the only thing that's in question right now is um, in yellow at the bottom. Plexiglass clear shields may be used where uh, classrooms utilize tables and where social distancing is not possible. We think that's going to have to be changed and we may have to um, purchase or alter the furnishings in those rooms to provide individual workspaces that can be socially distanced. Pausing again for a minute if there are any questions. All right, then we're on to specialized services, and this runs the gamut from how do we meet the needs of our gifted and talented to how do we um, provide for students that are English language learners or uh, those that have special educational needs. Um, again, it will base, be based on their plans, and uh, the teachers will sanitize spaces if they're bringing students into a separate space to work on a skill. Um, teachers will be wearing face shields and our masks at all times. And in some instances, as with our therapists, we may be using plexiglass uh, barriers, much like the ones you see in our offices right now at the elementary building. We did group all of the various modifications that we're making for reopening into the key performance indicators, which is how the board has been evaluating the success of our district. So we have the four major buckets that you see on this slide, and you'll see that we break down some of our, the aspects of our program into those four big buckets. So for operational efficiencies, we have put in uh, physical barriers in our offices and libraries um, to support the fact that sometimes students do need to come close, um, but in order to ensure that that is safe, um, we'll have a plexiglass um, shield, particularly where we may, might have guests from outside the building coming in. Uh, we're looking at purchasing floor decals and or using um, the colored tape, much as we have done um, during summer school right now. In terms of signage, the CDC provides uh, free print posters that are age appropriate, everything from very young child to adults. And those are free to print and laminate for posting around the building. We're going to be using water bottle fillers only. 
Um, and I know there's been some discussion about adding additional water, bo water bottle fillers at the elementary building. We are adding hand sanitizer stations around the building. Um, students not using lockers, but using backpacks instead. Um, already at the elementary building, if you've come for one of our athletic events, um, summer school, you'll see that we've removed much of the extra furniture and we're storing that in um, storage spaces and or the common spaces that we are not going to be using um, to optimize the amount of space inside the classroom for six foot distancing. And shared spaces, things like the commons or the cafeterias or other large spaces are not going to be used. Um, if they have to be used for larger group activities, they will be properly sanitized uh, between use. Modified traffic flows, we're trying to get one direction. If you come into the elementary now for any of our activities in summer school, there are arrows and um, caution tape that cause you to flow in one direction. And we are limiting non-essential visitors to the building. So when it comes to food service in 4K through 8, um, the food will come pre-plated. We are continuing the offer uh, versus the serve option, which means students get to choose up to two options um, that are pre-packaged and will be distributed by an adult. Um, at the high school level, closed campus, um, students will be going down to the kitchen and a la carte will continue to be available. Um, students will be in six foot distancing in their food service line. And again, either the staff will plate or pro provide the prepackaged food items for students to select. In terms of transportation, um, from the parent survey that was taken earlier uh, this summer, uh, we notice that there's quite an uptick in the number of families that are going to be transporting their own child. Um, this should provide some relief and additional spacing on the buses. During registration, we will be getting more definitive numbers on busing. Um, remember with the parent survey, not all of our parents took the survey. Uh, so this is reflective of um, roughly half the parents um, who took the survey. Uh, Cobison has a safety committee and they also have a safety director. They are working on company-wide policies, but when last we talked, uh, buses would have uh, disinfection between routes and that will be a standardized process from the company. Um, the first passengers on will go to the rear of the bus and then they will fill um, back to front. And when they get to their destination, they'll empty from front to back. They'll stake or seating to the degree it's possible. Uh, passengers that come from the same household would be allowed to sit together. Um, where it's optional, city pickup, um, some of our passengers have indicated that they may consider walking or biking, whether permitting. Uh, rather than taking the bus. And then we would disembark and load buses one at a time. So we'd have groups come into the vestibule. Um, once that group is in and on their way to class, the next bus would be unloaded. So we're trying to minimize again or pace the number of students in the corridor at one time. And then we do have to make sure that parents understand that um, physical distancing on the bus may not always be possible. So there may be some additional risks to bus riding and we want parents to be aware of that. Uh, we've also been asked to define face coverings. Um, it can be the traditional mask, um, it can be the gaiter, it can be um, 
a cloth face covering. There are any number of different kinds. Clintonville has done a really nice job of putting together um, both defining what a face covering could be and providing some visual prompts. But uh, the three primary components for the CDC is that it needs to cover the nose, cover the mouth, and fit around the face so that there are no air gaps. When we surveyed parents earlier this summer about face coverings or masks, um, the survey itself used the word mask at that time. That was the school perception survey language. Um, you'll note that predominantly um, when asked, parents did not feel that students needed to wear um, masks all day or during school events when social distancing was not able to be maintained. So that was 75.7% felt wearing masks was not necessary. Um, a similar question was asked of parents if staff should be wearing masks, either at school or at events. And um, the answer was no, 70.6% of the time. And then we asked the question, if others in schools were not wearing masks, would it prevent the parent from sending their child to school? And there we note 80% said no. We do have um, yes at 6.4 and 13.6% unsure. That 20% is fairly typical of um, the county and actually statewide schools who did a similar survey. Um, so there is some reservation on the part of some parents to send their, their children back to school if masks are not worn. Um, on average, that ranged more like um, 12 to 15% across the state. I have a question. Yes. Um, would it be possible to make more of a permanent type mask and provide them to the students? It could maybe say like manual wolves on it, have paw prints, something like that. A more fitted and a more permanent type mask? Um, the answer to that is yes. And we already have them. I'm gonna stop sharing a minute so that you can see me. Um, it's not fun, but it's free. Um, the state provided 1,500 masks to the school district of Manawa. We already have them. Um, this is a multi-layered um, mask with um, stretchy bands. Um, it's kind of a terry cloth feel material and does fit to the face. Um, you can adjust sizing by for a, a smaller child by folding it over, it fits just fine. Um, and you can shorten by tying or using little elastics. I was so, thinking, I was and, thinking more of like a colored one, red, red and black, or, you know, a custom type one. I think that's great and very fun. Um, in, that's certainly possible if parents would like to buy those. Um, one thing that you'll note about these is we'll be washing them daily in hot water and bleach. And so I think if you purchased a more decorative style, um, I'm not sure how well they'd hold up in the long run. I think the state probably has this type because they're a little more resilient given the nature of the washing that needs to be done. But just wanted you to know we already have these um, as well as a few other options. All right, thank you. You're very welcome. Dr. Opper, Mrs. Christensen had asked, could the free ones be silk screened? I don't, I don't know. I've never asked that question. Um, I don't know how it would hold up um, in the wash. I know the nice t-shirts that I have, I don't bleach those. I'm, I'm kind of careful with them so that they hold up longer. So 
Um, that would be something I'd have to look into. But I'll make note of that. And I will ask if they would hold up. I do agree that the more fun they look, um, the more a person's likely to want to wear it. And um, I did look into a team spirit one, but I wasn't able to get one um, on such short notice, but I wanted one for graduation. Um, so the recommendation right now would be when would face coverings um, be required in school? And it would be all the time when physical distancing of six feet cannot be maintained. Um, there would be an exception, and that's when students are seated at his or her individual workspace alone. And that's with the understanding that those workspaces are at six foot distancing in the classroom. So if a student comes in with their mask on, they sit down in their workspace, um, they would be able to take the mask off. But just as I keep mine handy at my desk, um, students would need to keep them at the ready because if the teacher approaches and is going to work with them, maybe it's math time, checking on how they're processing the information, the student would need to put their mask back on. Uh, when the teacher steps away, the student would be able to remove it again. What we're hearing from the Department of Health and Health Services as well as the CDC is we're monitoring exposure times for close contacts. That a close contact is considered being in less than six foot proximity with or without mask for 15 minutes or more. And that 15 minutes can be consecutive 15 minutes or cumulative 15 minutes over a 24 hour period. The expectation for staff would be that they would be wearing face coverings always in the presence of students, even when they are socially distanced. And we are looking at a wide variety of different types to include uh, face shields. And there is a form of face shield that has uh, the same fabric you might find in the hospital type mask. Uh, with an elastic so that you don't have to wear both mask and face shield. They're kind of an all-in-one piece, uh, which might be nice for students um, such as uh, students that are deaf or hard of hearing uh, that need to be able to lip read um, and be able to clearly see the person who's speaking. Uh, staff would wear face coverings when in corridors because we don't know who we're going to encounter as we're traveling about. And when adults are working together, could be prep times and other times when six foot distancing cannot be maintained. Under safe and orderly environment, one of our other buckets, um, we have a variety of different protocols now for health visits to include having an isolation room in both of the buildings. And in, in fact, we're looking to have at least one isolation room and a backup room in case we have more than one ill person at a time that needs to be assessed. Um, the air handlers are exchanging air per code. Um, so we verified that at both buildings and all air filters will be changed here at the elementary before summer school starts at the other building before school reopens on September 8th. Uh, we're talking about cleaning and disinfecting protocols. Um, we're either putting away shared objects or we're disinfecting between uses. Um, we see this um, actively being demonstrated right now in our skill and drill sport activities um, so that when balls or other materials are being used by students, uh, before that ball is handed off to a different person, um, it's sanitized. Uh, so you see every um, young 
person in volleyball has their own ball that they're using for their drills. And then hand hygiene, again, we're going to practice proper 20 second hand washing, making sure that we're being thorough about that, um, especially with our younger students who might not be familiar with it, and then how to properly use hand sanitizer. So as a person enters the health room, uh, we want to quickly screen right at the reception desk, uh, what is the person coming in for? So is this a scrape, a bee sting, a bruise? Uh, we want to get them into the traditional health room uh, to have that need taken care of, or are they presenting with um, COVID-like symptoms? In which case they would go immediately to the isolation room. Um, for the isolation room, um, we're predominantly going to be having either the school nurse or the office personnel supporting um, students in that area. So we are ordering um, the white long uh, lab coats. We have gloves, we have masks, face shields, uh, but we'll make sure all of those items are uh, readily available for uh, the people in the front office who may be working with a person who is ill with COVID-like symptoms. One of the things that will be extremely important is for parents to keep their emergency contact lists up to date. Um, it is possible for um, parents to go into uh, Skyward and update phone numbers as they might change. So it's going to be very important that we do that. Um, the county has also created a screening sheet it's the kind of thing that's designed to be kept on uh, a magnet on the refrigerator or on the kitchen counter. It just prompts parents to verify that their child doesn't have a temperature before they send them to school. And then it reminds them of the um, possible COVID-19 symptoms to kind of reflect with their child if their child is experiencing any of those symptoms that can't be explained by other health conditions like allergies or asthma or other things that have been diagnosed and are part of the child's health plan. We did include in the presentation from the CDC um, what we know presently to be the symptoms of COVID-19. But as you know, um, this list has grown since um, the CDC first put out a list um, and so we continue to monitor that and adjust the list as, um, as the CDC becomes aware of other symptoms. We also included the CDC's recommendation for when to seek emergency medical attention. And on this particular slide, anything in the deeper blue color is a link that takes you to the CDC website where you would find additional information, both on what it means to quarantine, um, more information on symptoms, and who might be at higher risk um, of becoming very sick if they were to contract COVID-19. Um, so quarantine being staying home for 14 days after your last contact with a person who has um, COVID-19. We also were requested to put down a protocol for re-entry after illness. Uh, the CDC currently recommends that once you are free of fever for 24 hours, and that's without needing to take um, pain relieving medication, and that your respiratory symptoms have improved, and that it's been at least 10 days since your symptoms first appeared, um, you would be ready to return to school. Um, you'll notice that um, the 24 hours with no fever um, a couple of weeks ago had been 72 hours um, with no fever, and the CDC has since changed that or decreased that down to 24 hours or one day with no fever. Um, they also indicate that um, either a doctor could give a readmit um, and in the case of our medical advisor, he said um, 
his nurse would be authorized to assist with that kind of readmit where appropriate. She knows how to do the screening and or um, COVID-19 testing. So having two negative tests in a row, 24 hours apart, that would indicate that <clears throat> you're no longer an active carrier. So I'll pause there a minute before going on to the technology section. Will the kids have to have like their temperature taken when they walk in the building in the morning or no? You broke up a little bit, but I, th I think I heard you ask if students would have their temperature taken when they entered the building. Correct. Um, the answer is no. Um, one of the concerns uh, that DHS and even the CDC has in their latest guidelines is um, that it might cause too many people to congregate um, waiting to, to have temperatures um, taken. Um, so we're asking that the screening be done at home before kids get to school and we would take the temperature of a student if they present with COVID-like symptoms or are complaining of things like chills or other indicators that would, would lead the person um, in the office to believe that a student might have a fever. Did I cover your question? Thank you. Yes, Melanie. You're welcome. All right, thank you. Hey, Dr. Opper. Yeah, I noted that Matt is on the line now, so I didn't know if perhaps you wanted to cut away at some point to let him give his presentation or if that would be appropriate or not. Just thought I'd ask. Um, when I'm done with this presentation, um, then we'll, we won't break mid-presentation. Um, so we're now to the technology section. So when parents were surveyed about technology. Before um, you can on, Dr. Opper, um, there is one question out there that actually relates to the previous slide um, as far as testing, and that is from Jeremy Bennett, who asks, is that an antigen or a mucusal test? Um, that would be the swab test, um, I believe is what is currently being used, but I will jot that down and confirm that with DHS. Uh, because I don't want to give any misleading information. And thank you, Jeremy, for asking that question. Sorry, I didn't catch it. Thank you, President Johnson, for, for monitoring the chat box. And when I get that answer, Jeremy, I can add that also to the slideshow for the sake of clarity. Moving then on to um, technology, most of our parents, 82.1%, indicated that they had um, reliable internet at home. Um, so 59.5% felt very confident or confident in supporting technology at home. Um, that was reassuring, although we had hoped that the numbers would be higher. Uh, so you're going to see in an upcoming slide that we're going to do some things, hopefully to build confidence, both of students and parents, uh, since we are going to have more technology available for families, should that be needed. And then who owns the devices? And you see it's a fairly good blend of um, personal and district owned uh, devices. So Mr. Kobrubius is putting together a technology plan to support learning, and he divided it across um, numerous groups. So ensuring that all students, 4K through 12, have a one-to-one -one device that's appropriate for their age group. Uh, so that means that we will be doing a tablet type of uh, device. It's made by the, the Chromebook manufacturer. Um, but for those that are familiar with the iPad, it's, it's a Chrome pad, um, similar to that, functions like that, 
uh, works well for the younger age child who might not yet know how to type. And then we have added Chromebooks so that there is enough that each student would have their own device. And we heard um, Mrs. Cerno explaining earlier that one of the things teachers will be doing is giving children in class an opportunity to get used to their devices, practicing in class with the teacher so that if they were learning from home, either because we have a snow day or we have some kind of a school closure, that students would be more confident in how their devices work. But you'll also see on um, the outreach development section, one of the things uh, we're going to be providing are some little tutorials for families about how this technology works so that parents can guide the younger students or older students for that matter um, to use their devices and um, where to access information. So if parents are looking for um, ease of information, they need to know about student assignments or they need to know about student grades um, there will be directions on how to easily find the information parents are looking for. We'll be supporting distance learning using cameras and microphones in the classroom. So those that need to be learning from home can do that in real time and hopefully feel more a part of the classroom. Uh, and will expand wireless hotspot access as needed um, to make that possible for families to receive that connectivity at home. And staff are already receiving some online learning opportunities, but that will be um, increased in the next few weeks. Mr. Kobrubius, is there anything you'd add uh, since this is your slide and you're on right now? No, I, I think you covered it, um, covered it well. Um, the, the big point is just we just want to expand technology to make sure everybody has access to something and then support teachers in using it, support students in using it. And then something we haven't done before uh, is to help the parents um, access and use technology as well. Thank you. Um, with emergency drills, um, we will be introducing the ALICE protocols this fall. Uh, there will be more information going out to parents on ALICE um, as we move forward with the program. Uh, but we did not do our full hands-on training this summer with all staff as we had planned. So we will be rolling out a modified version of that. So teaching the basic principles of how to assess safety in your surroundings and take the necessary steps to keep yourself and those around you safe. Um, with fire drills, we will practice exiting the build, building as quickly and efficiently as possible. Once we get outside, we'll be doing roster checks and um, checking in with um, office staff while doing social distancing. We have large enough properties where we can space classes six feet apart from each other and have people in their rows six feet uh, apart from each other. And finally, with tornado drills, we're going to rehearse how to get to your designated location. But in the event of an actual tornado, in speaking with our um, fire chief who assists us with emergency protocols of this type, it would be more important that we get to our basement storm shelters at the high school with our high school and middle, stu middle school students um, to protect them from the storm um, and worry later about managing the potential exposure that may have happened with COVID-19. So the tornado there would present a more imminent risk um, than would the virus in that situation if we had an active tornado in the area. And then learning at the elementary building, um, teachers are going to stay, um, excuse me, students are going to stay with their classroom teacher. Uh, specials are going to come to them for the most part. Um, we're working again to remove furnishings from the room to accommodate student desks at six foot distancing. 
And again, live synchronous opportunities will be available and those lessons will also be recorded for students that may, maybe because of health needs need to watch the recordings at other times of the day. Sometimes it's just helpful to watch a lesson more than once. Uh, lunch will be delivered to the classroom. Um, there'll be staggered recesses and play areas. And since we have two sections of each, um, one teacher will assist in supervising students while the other teacher will take their 30 minute duty free. And that kind of schedule has been uh, developed by the principals for both buildings. Um, if that hasn't already been discussed, I'm sure they will be doing that at an upcoming meeting. And then because we have AM and PM classes for uh, four-year-old kindergarten and early childhood, there will be disinfecting that would go on between the two sessions. Uh, so again, we are not cross-contaminating cross between classes. A lot of this we've gone over in an earlier slide toward the beginning, so I will go rather quickly here. With social emotional learning, um, both school counselors were a part of the committee. Um, both are very aware that many of our young people have struggled um, due to feelings of social isolation or just not the, the level of um, social emotional connection that they normally would have. So they are working on strategies uh, that they will be building with students um, embedding across the curriculum. And we'll also be working with staff on how to connect and heal during this time because we know some students have really struggled. Um, and so emotionally, we're going to need to fill the cup of some of our students who, who are going to be coming to us really starved for that kind of um, personal connection that they're so accustomed to at school. During our parent survey, uh, we also asked some questions around the topics of engagement and satisfaction. Um, so to recap, as I mentioned earlier, roughly half of our families uh, responded to the survey. For us, uh, that's an especially good response rate, the highest we've had on any of the surveys we've completed to date. Um, about half of those same respondents said learning went fair or poor um, this past spring. So we knew that we needed to make improvements as we move forward for those families that would still be choosing uh, the synchronous or shall we call it virtual learning, online learning um, this fall. 69.9% um, at that time said that someone was home to support children's learning. We do know that most, if not all, of our families have gone back to work or are otherwise occupied during the day now. So returning to school was incredibly important. And 37.8% report being confident or very confident in helping their child with learning at home. And then probably the most important question is, will your child be attending the school district of Manawa this fall and 87.1% said yes. And the no and unsure total of roughly 12% is fairly consistent, uh, again, across the state. Uh, families are waiting in some instances to see the plan uh, that you're looking at this evening, uh, seeing what is approved by the Board of Education before making their decision about what they would like their child to do this fall. Dr. So Robert, we can pause yeah. for just a moment. Um, Amy Bodard has a question, has two questions actually. Will students be able to bring lunches in still? Also, will there be recess? Um, yes to both, Amy. Um, students can still bring their own uh, lunches from home. Um, and I believe uh, snacks for many elementary students are also quite commonplace. So yes, we, we would encourage people that prefer to do so to continue providing their own lunch and snack. 
Um, will there be recesses? And the answer is yes. Um, they'll be staggered, so there'll be fewer students outside at any given point. Um, we'll be practicing sanitation. Um, I know that, for example, Ms. Brower has purchased many more toys so that um, every student who wants a ball can have a ball. They, they don't need to worry about sharing. She's looking at getting basketball backboards, which we haven't had for a while. And she has a number of grants that are out right now um, where she is planning to do games on the blacktop. So games that don't necessarily require um, things that you handle, but she's looking at a wide variety of um, different things for children to do and updating the playground in general. Thank you, that's a great question. And I will put that on because we could add a little more information in the slideshow on that as well for parents. We also did a staff survey. Um, we probably need to ask a few more questions, but I'll share the information we do have of our 84 staff members. We received 60 responses, 71% of our, our staff. Um, so we see that 71.7% of the staff would wear, would be willing to wear a face mask or shield. When working at school, uh, we did ask the comfort level um, of staff members if that would increase if their fellow staff members were wearing a mask or shield. And for about half of our staff, they said yes and uh, about a quarter of them didn't have an opinion on that particular topic. Overall, we asked um, between now and the start of school on September 8th, keeping in mind the health protocols, if our staff would feel comfortable returning to work. And so we see that uh, the majority of staff do feel comfortable returning to work. Um, we did say that we would have administrators as appropriate contact staff. This was a private survey, although it was not um, anonymous. Um, so we will be checking in with folks to see if we have some staff members that might need special accommodations. Um, I do see a question in the chat box about will the school day be extended to accommodate changes? Um, we are not suggesting that at this time. Uh, the school district of Manawa, both at the elementary and secondary level, have always had uh, more than enough instructional minutes per the state guidelines. Um, even if we took all six snow days, for example, um, we still had more than enough minutes um, without needing uh, to add minutes to our day or do snow day makeup. Uh, so we feel we're comfortable at this point. Uh, fall sports, um, this is a very um, difficult slide to present because it's a moving target right now. Last week, the WIAA did meet and has created some recommendations. Um, they're looking at sports like cross country that might be considered a more of a uh, low risk sport to be able to start contact in August. Um, at races, they would be wearing a mask at the starting line and at the finish line, but during mid race, as soon as the, the grouping spread out, they would be able to the, take that, that mask or face covering off. Um, that's being suggested with uh, more high risk sports like football. Um, they're talking about having that start more like September 7th. The CWC, which is our conference, uh, is meeting tomorrow uh, to go over implementation details. Uh, so there would need to be a lot of training we need to talk about how we're gonna to have to practice in cohorts, especially in the high risk sports um, to be able to ensure that we can field a team safely. 
So uh, there's a lot up in the air. Um, fall sports, we're probably going to have to have further conversation. And this slide may very well change. And then as everyone in the county, and, and I do believe the state, has been asked to include the closing slide that all of these plans are subject to change based on uh, changing health and safety conditions. So as more things come to light or local or state conditions were to change, we may have to adapt. So with that, I'm going to stop presenting and give more of an opportunity for conversation here per the direction of President Johnson. I'm going to just remind everyone because I know that we have a tremendous amount of staff members that are with us tonight. You know, if you if you want, we're certainly going to have some public comment on this. Um, and obviously, we want to allow Mr. McGregor to be able to present his stuff too, instead of being tied all up in our board meeting all night long. Um, item number 10, we'll we'll get to the questions. And I know three staff members have signed up already. You know, please, if if you want to have some discussion or you have questions, you know, get in that chat box and let us know so that, you know, we can do that. Um, if there are no immediate pressing questions, I would jump down to Mr. McGregor um, to do his presentation so that we can occupy no more of his time than what we already have this evening. No worries on my end. I really appreciate the flexibility, um, as always, um, trying to do the double board meeting. But uh, um, I'll make it short and sweet, if that is OK with everybody. Um, and I actually have uh, Mackenzie with us this afternoon, um, evening. Uh, she's got our intern on site. Uh, most of you had met her at our last tour. Um, she's going to be doing the majority of the presentation this evening. And I'm just going to hit the high point on um, budget and some COVID issues. Um, as far as budget goes, right now we are sitting with a current projected amount of about $670,000 remaining in contingencies and allowances. Um, so going into August, we're, we're really comfortable as to where we're sitting. Um, and really a lot of the underground items that we had identified, um, the plumbing items that we had identified, those should be behind us. There should just be a few little items we're cleaning up to get through the end of the project. And um, my, my hope is really to turn over um, some additional dollars back to the district to um, accomplish some additional projects. Uh, one COVID item that did uh, um, come up last week uh, related to our epoxy tops in the science classrooms. Um, that item, it was present or notified us of, from our vendor that the epoxy tops in the middle school and high school science rooms, which are the epoxy resin tops, the chemical resistant tops um, and sinks, that vendor had been having some issues with COVID in their facility. Um, and we actually got pushed back onto their schedule the initial date they gave us was latter in latter part of September. So not positive. Um, we initially looked at targeting, uh, putting temporary tops on those countertop or those cabinets because um, the cabinets are actually on site as of last week, Thursday. But since uh, that news came out, they are improving on this date. They're looking at other vendors that can supply them a little bit quicker, uh, same type of product, different manufacturer, but they are looking at improving on that date and we're still pushing um, and trying to get them on site so that we can have epoxy tops in those science rooms prior to students coming back. Um, it's going to really be right down to the wire um, and there could be some potential weekend uh, overtime work to get those cabinets and countertops completed for the school year. but. We're, we're trying everything we possibly can and pull out all the stops to get that uh, put together in time for the students to come back. Um, any questions on budget or uh, the one COVID item that I brought up? With that, I will turn it over to Mackenzie and she can kind of give you a rundown on schedule as we sit currently. 
All right. Hi, everyone. Um, as of right now with the project, we are in the final push towards completion with finishes getting installed in all areas of the building. The first phase of punch lists are happening this Wednesday. The areas that are ready for the first phase include the admin edition, special ed, fitness edition, a part of area E, choir room, elementary school renovations, and the lower level. Areas yet to finish up are the main entrance, middle school renovations, the commons, stage, band room, high school collaboration and classrooms, tech ed, and the exterior of the high school. These areas will be a part of the second phase of punch list, which will happen around mid to end of August. Also, about mid to end of August, we should be able to turn some spaces um, of the building to start moving in. Any questions? It's getting exciting. I contacted our fitness center uh, vendor uh, to schedule the installation. So it, it's going to be really exciting when we start to see those new items going into that beautiful space. I know this phase of the project, we, we often get a lot of questions, um, especially now that you had graduation on um, Saturday. A lot of people saw the space and their questions might come up that Hey, are are you gonna make it? Or is everything gonna be ready on time? Um, we are we are looking that we're gonna have everything ready and occupiable for the students. That doesn't mean that Hoffman is gonna be done, gone, and off the job site. We're gonna be we're gonna still be around. We're gonna be taking care of loose ends, cleaning everything up, and making sure that we're um, completing all of our contractual obligations with the district and with the contractors, and making sure everything is completed um, satisfactory. Um, but with that, a lot of these spaces, you can go in them one week and Mackenzie would know firsthand, you go in them one day and then two, three days later, that's a completely different space. They, they turn around so quick when you get into these finishing stages where um, floorings go down, um, caseworks get set, ceilings go in. It really, those spaces transform really, really quick. Any other questions referendum related? Anything to say on um, the vacant lot? I, I know uh, I actually parked in the new parking lot on Saturday, but for those that haven't been passed recently, do you want to talk a little bit about that? And perhaps when are the light poles going in? Um, the light poles are on site. Uh, they should be going in. They're, they're getting the contractor on site. They should be going in in the next couple weeks. And that'll kind of be the last piece to button up that, um, the operational referendum project um, as it was the old elementary school site. So that, that'll uh, be a long time coming because that was one of the first projects we started when the referendum passed and it'll be um, coming up very, very quick to turn that over to the district and uh, get that space as well punched out and turned over. Any other questions? Thank you. Thank you again for the flexibility and I hope everybody has a wonderful evening. Thank you, Matt. Thank you, Mackenzie. All right, item six, annual board appointments. Um, I am appointing Director Lucas Seeger to the vacant position on the Board of Education Curriculum Committee, and that will run through next April. Um, announcements, contributions to the district. We received a donation from A Storm and Sons Foundation Incorporated, $3,000 for our fine arts program. Consent agenda, would any board member like any item removed from the consent agenda to be dealt with separately? I don't know if I need it removed, but could you review who the coaches are for those three positions? It should be coming up on your screen. Are you able? I see it. All right, I'll scan through those then. Ms. Bruce, I was gonna say, can I recant from voting on the consent agenda? Well, it's by general consent, so. <laughs> okay. Um, and then uh, the next grouping is football. 
and that I'm going to have to scroll a little here to get everybody's name in. Okay, and scrolling one more time. I hate to make you dizzy, but now we're down to volleyball. Did you catch those? I did. Thank you. You're very welcome. And Mr. Scheller, if you would be like to be noted as having abstained from uh, comments on the consent agenda, even though we vote by general consent, it is it is duly noted um, as you are one of the uh, the pending coaches. Um, would any board member like any item removed from the consent agenda to be dealt with separately? Okay, then we will vote by general consent. And hearing no dissent, the consent agenda carries. Item number 10, public comments. And so first one that uh, got their name in tonight would be Ms. Breaker, um, health and safety face coverings, if you would. Pardon, I do believe the first person signed up is um, Sandra Ryerson. Oh, I apologize. I was looking at the chat box and mine only goes up to Ms. Breaker. Oh, okay. I took a, a written note as well as we were going along. Gotcha. Okay. Sorry. So then we, I'm sorry, Breaker, we will, we will have Ms. Ms. Ryerson go first, please. Thank you. School opening, Sandra Ryerson. Uh, what is the data that supports mask requirements and cohorts? The reopening presentation doesn't give you a breakdown of the information used in the risk de designation. They use burden case rate per 100,000 and trajectory percentage case rate from previous to current week. Counting cases, the CDC is counting influenza, pneumonia, and COVID altogether in a case number. We should be able to understand what particular illness is driving the positive numbers. Can we believe the numbers? At the end of last week, Andrea Palm stated that at least 17,000 negative test results were not being documented at the same rate as positive tests. Have all of the WAPAC county numbers been accounted for? These numbers have influence over the risk calculation. Senator Nash is calling on state and local public health officials to publicly announce in their agencies currently having backlogs or had backlogs at any time since at least June 1st in reporting negative COVID test results. He's also demanding that state and Local public health officials appropriately correct all data, particularly positivity rate calculations upon entering all backlog negative results. If we review the trends, positive versus hospitalization and death, positive, death res positive test results have been going up, but more importantly, hospitalization and death numbers have been consistently trending downward since the end of May. This should be celebrated as it is an indication that the severity of the illness based on a positive test number is going down. Hospitalizations for Wapaka County, as of today, there were 15 people hospitalized for COVID in the Fox Valley region, which we are part of with seven other counties. What about deaths in Wapaka County? Of the 14 deaths recorded in Wapaka County as of July 12th, 11 of the 14 were from one facility. This would indicate that the remainder of the population outside of this one facility is doing very well as far as the, the severity of anyone testing positive for COVID. Do the masks proposed actually work to keep virus particles from getting to someone? What clinical studies have been presented to support that hypothesis? Have there been clinical studies to determine the effect of long-term mask usage for children? CDC publication, EDI Journal, volume 26, number five, has an evaluation of some documented mass testing. One finding in a pooled analysis, we found no significant reduction in influenza transmission with the use of face masks. In volume 26, number 10, the following is stated about cloth masks. To our knowledge, only one randomized controlled trial has been conducted to examine the efficacy of cloth masks in a healthcare setting, and the results do not favor use of cloth masks. More randomized controlled trials should be conducted in community settings to test the efficacy of cloth masks against respiratory infections. What's a clear gate that we have to pass to get back to normal? If we're waiting for an effective vaccine, how are we going to know it's effective? Remember, influenza, pneumonia, and COVID are grouped together. Every year there's an opportunity for a flu vaccine and pneumonia, and we know that that's not 100% effective. I also believe that the Manoa School District needs to have an advisory medical professional who is neutral in the COVID discussion. I believe that there may be a conflict of interest with Dr. Gedderts as he's also on the Wapaka County DHS committee. 
Let's look at all the numbers and facts for our specific area and make fact-based decisions, which continue to allow parents to decide the best choices for their children. Thank you. Thank you, Mrs. Ryerson. Did you have anyone else, Dr. Opper, before the chat box group? Um, no, second on the list was Ms. Breaker. All right, Ms. Breaker, if you would like to go ahead, please. All right. Um, thank you for the opportunity to speak tonight. My offering to you is fairly simple in that my focus is solely on the health and safety of everyone who enters our school buildings. Above all, lately, that is what keeps me up at night, as I am sure it does for all of you. We as a district and you, the school board, with the final say, always have the safety of our students and staff at the forefront of our policies and procedures. So that is nothing new. But what's new this time around are the potential unknowns. What's new this time around is the pace of the changes. And what's new this time around is the feelings of the lack of some control that we have. And that can make us feel overwhelmed and even sometimes bitter about the situation we are all in. Under those circumstances, it can be hard to keep our focus on what we and you have always done, keeping the safety of our students and staff above all else when making decisions. So here we are together to figure out what is the healthiest and safest way to open our school doors and to protect everyone inside our walls the best that we can. For those of you who do not know, I teach seventh and eighth graders. Those kids, your kids, become my kids too for nine months out of the year. Together we work through review skills, new skills, hard skills, frustrating skills, I teach math, that tends to go along with the territory. I teach life skills, social skills, and so much more. I am there to help them and show them how to help themselves. I am more than any, I more than anything want to continue to do that. But I know that inside that classroom, there is typically not a lot of extra room when we are in there all together. There isn't an abundance of space for those middle school sized children for their desks, their chairs, their stuff, and me. And that's during a regular year. What keeps me up at night is trying to figure out how I can possibly help a student at one end of the classroom and then walk to the exact opposite side of that room and help another student. And then make my way to the child in the middle of the classroom to see what they're working on and what they need help with. I can't do that without getting closer than the safest recommended distance of six feet to almost every kid that I would have to walk past. That scares me for my safety and for theirs. If we are all in there together, then we need to be protected. If I knew that all my students in that room and I would be wearing a face covering to help mitigate the risk of transmission of coronavirus, because we can't always guarantee that safe six foot distance, then I would feel much better in that scenario, knowing that all of us together would be doing what is within our control to keep us all safe and healthy. There are so many unknowns and changes and things we can't control, but this, this is absolutely within your power to choose to protect everyone inside our walls. I am 43 years old and that is not scary. I have four health conditions that are high risk factors of severe complications or worse with COVID-19. And I'm a teacher who wants to continue to help kids. Right now, that's a bit terrifying. Please stay focused on the health and safety of your staff and your students, your children. We are all entrusting you. And for what it's worth, please also remember that I, I am someone's child and I know my parents are praying that you do everything in your power to ensure their daughter's safety too. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Breaker. Um, Ann Warning, Ms. Warning. Good evening. Um, I'm just, uh, a lot of the concerns I had, the comments I made were addressed as you went through your meeting tonight. So I don't have a, 
a great deal to say, but as Tracy said, um, the position I'm in, um, at my age right now, I, I'm trusting that um, we, everybody does what they can to make us as safe as possible. Um, the face coverings, that the masks where, they, where you talked about um, if, it, if six feet would not be maintained, um, I would like to suggest that it be possible for individual teachers maybe to um, be able to have that option to require students to come in um, and have a face mask in their class um, individually, depending on where our, where we are at and what our health issues are, what our ages are. Thank you for listening. Morning, Jeannie Meyer, Ms. Meyer. Hi, um, I'm Jeannie Meyer. Um, I am a staff member at the elementary school. Um, a lot of my points were also made by um, Tracy Breaker earlier. Um, I too am worried about the health and safety, not only of my students, but myself. Um, I am in the older age bracket and also have an underlying condition and I I just feel the safest thing to do right now is the only thing that we can do is wear the face coverings to help mitigate the spread. I mean, I wanna remain in my classroom and I wanna remain healthy. And if I'm out sick with COVID, who's there to teach my class? I don't think there are very many subs that are gonna be willing to come into a classroom. Um, I have 26 students on my list this year. Um, but that's a lot of elementary students and typically, typical of them, they are not going to be socially distant very easily. Um, there is no possible way to social distance of six feet with 20 stu 26 students and their desks in my classroom. Um, I just want everyone to be safe. Thank you for listening. Thank you, Ms. Meyer. Um, Amy and I am, Ms. Meyer. Good evening. Thank you for listening. Um, I just I wanted to bring up something that Miss Warning had pointed out that we could make you know that some teachers could require it and others wouldn't. I think if we don't all have a unified procedure in our school district, or at least at the high school, middle school level, that it would just create more problems and disciplinary as well as behavioral for the students if they don't know what to expect from the whole school. So I just wanted to address that fact that I think we need to be united in this as a school. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Anaya. Um, Nancy Zabler, Nancy, please, Ms. Zabler. Hi, um, I agree with Amy. I think we all need to stick together on this. I also agree. Um, with Tracy, this is very emotional for us. Obviously, teachers love their students as we love our own children. We want to be with our students, but we are also concerned about our own families. Um, one thing to remember, I think, about this is this is, there's so many unknowns. This is a pandemic. Um, this is not the flu. There are some people that will get flu-like symptoms, and that's all they're going to get. But there are so many unknowns about this disease. We are finding out there are so many long-term effects from this disease. So even if we come out of it with flu-like symptoms, we don't know what's going to happen down the road with this. I think anything that we can do to protect each other, we need to do. I, I will protect my students to the best of my ability. I will protect my staff to the best of my ability. I hope my school board will also protect all of us to the best of their ability. I would appreciate at the very least that everyone is required to wear masks. I believe in science. I believe in the math involved in this. There are studies that say that it hangs in the air. Obviously in my field, I need to go in close to students and help them. I, I can't teach from six feet away. I have to walk in towards them to help them. If they have their masks off 
and just by breathing and talking and possibly coughing, they have sort of a cloud around them that I'm walking into. So I would appreciate at the very least that everyone is required to wear masks. Thank you. Thank you, Mrs. Adler. I do want to just throw it out there. I know that there are some people that are by phone and I'm not sure if you have the ability to register in the chat box if you're calling in, I'm guessing not. Is there anyone that has called in by voice that wishes to speak on the topic? Um, Mr. Kobarubius has indicated star six will unmute your phone if you are struggling. Okay, I'm not seeing anyone unmute themselves, so we will, and, oops, and there is no one else in the, uh, the chat box, so we will go ahead then at this point and move on. Uh, correspondence. We had a thank you card from Mrs. Frazier. And um, thank you, Dr. Rapper. Um, Dear Board of Education, thank you for the beautiful flowers on my last day before retirement. It was very thoughtful of you. I really appreciate it. Thank you for thinking of me. It meant a lot to me. Board recognition, we have none this month. District Administrator's Report, Dr. Opper. Thank you very much. So this evening, um, Reese Poppy is our student council representative, and I did not have an opportunity to check. Is Reese on with us? Yes. Hi, Reese. How are you? Pretty good. Excellent. Your voice sounds great. Love the Wisconsin Badger. Um, so what are the issues on the minds of high school students right now? What are you hearing? Um, most people that I've talked to, which hasn't been that terribly many, is most people want to go to school. Like they want to be in school. They'd rather that than online school. And uh, some people that I've talked to have been worried about like the AB schedule, how it, it, it kind of be like separating the class almost because like half the, half the people wouldn't see the other half. You've got a point there. Yeah, it's true. Um, are you hearing anything on summer school so far? I've seen a lot of people passing through for weightlifting, a variety of the skill and drill. We've, we've had um, some football, basketball, I think, pass through here. Uh, volleyball started just today. I haven't heard too much on people's feelings of uh, summer school. Anything else that that's rumbling around in your head that you'd like to be sure that the board knows about? Um, not that I can think of. Well, it's a pleasure to have you with us. Um, if there's anything you want to add at some point later, um, feel free to do so. Uh, we like having you here. In terms of the legislative update, um, lots of activity going on. Um, so the Washington Times reports the White House and Senate Republicans reached agreement on a key part of a coronavirus stimulus proposal that includes $105 billion for schools and billions more for testing. Um, the Senate Appropriations Chair Shelby announced a fundamental agreement on funding levels, and Senate Majority Leader McConnell will unveil the plan in pieces, um, and that was later last week. The overall proposal is expected to cost about $1 trillion. 
uh, Mr. McConnell is also pushing for liability protections for businesses as they reopen during the pandemic. In instruction, the Senate Committee on Government Operations, Technology and Consumer Protection, chaired by State Senator Dewey Strobel, a former school board member, held an informational hearing on virtual instructional instruction and virtual schools on July 23rd. Informational hearings are used by legislators to learn more about a given top, pop, topic from their stakeholders. Um, so we also had testimony from uh, the Wisconsin School Board Association, uh, usually with one identified member. Uh, Governor Evers um, from his office announced 155 local education agencies are eligible to apply for $46.6 million provided to Wisconsin through the Governor's Emergency Education Relief Fund that was established under the Coronavirus Aid Relief and Economic Security Act. Uh, the announcement came as last month, the governor announced more than $80 million in financial assistance for K-12 schools and higher education. And the National School Board Association had a gap day of action on July 21st. The NSBA is helping lead a national effort calling attention to the digital divide in education. The COVID-19 pandemic has highlighted a long documented and persistent uh, inequity of affecting students that lack adequate broadband access. Uh, they sent out an action alert and encouraged WASB members to demonstrate their support for closing the homework gap and supporting the FCC's E-rate program. And we had talked locally how beneficial that would be to enhance rural broadband in our part of Wisconsin. And in terms of our summer school update, um, we had athletes uh, regularly traveling uh, to the elementary building in cohorts to participate in activities, and those seem to be going extremely well. Attendance rates seem to be up. Um, regular summer school, as, as we more traditionally might know it, uh, starts on August 3rd. Um, I believe as of last Thursday, we had about 57 students enrolled in um, 4K through 7th grade. Uh, hunter safety was going to be held in the evening. I think at that time we had 12 students enrolled and there was plenty of room for more kids to sign up if they want to. Um, and then in terms of driver's education, we had well over 30 students enrolled in driver's education and that's going to be an online class this year. And Ms. Eck was still totaling numbers for uh, students in the high school level doing a credit recovery program. So hopefully we'll have um, numbers to report on that soon. They had run a rough tabulation of their financials and we do count the FTEs from summer school as a factor into our state aid formula and it looked like we might have about 8.5 FTEs, um, which is not as high as we've had in recent years, uh, but was still a solid number. So um, that meant that participation is good, um, but it's not too late to contact Mr. Keller or Ms. Eck if there are students that would still like to enroll in any of the programs, particularly those credit recovery programs so that we don't have students entering the school year credit deficient. Uh, the census report uh, was in your packet. And um, so that stands in place of what we usually do once a month, which is looking at um, enrollments in school. Uh, 
Mrs. Flynn is the individual in the district who does um, the district required census. This is separate from those federal census reports that many of you have uh, filled out and sent in from home. Uh, this is a count that we're required to do that affects um, state aid and funding for schools. Um, so it looks like in the school age category, if you looked at five-year-olds to 18-year-olds, there are roughly 873 uh, people in that age range. Um, and of course, we know there are many options besides the public option for education. So those are divided among all the private schools um, that are also accessible in our region. And from the curriculum perspective, um, starting on July 1st, I became the curriculum director. Um, that'll be a hat I'll wear, but I'll also be sharing it with the principals. So in future meetings, uh, we'll talk about, um, I'll assist the person running the curriculum uh, board committee in setting agenda, getting those published, um, I'll also be helping with the part of um, getting curriculum maps approved by the board and processing payment for that. But much of the actual curriculum work is still going to be happening at the building level, led by the principals. So as we look at that, we'll be mapping that out a little more clearly and talking uh, with the curriculum committee at the next meeting. Uh, so that's the way we've kind of divided things. So under my report, I will start including um, the curriculum report in future meetings. Any questions on any of those topics this evening? Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Rapper. School operations reports. Does anyone have any questions regarding either uh, Mr. Wolfram or Ms. Brower's reports that Dr. Opper can relate to them? Okay. Business report. Does anyone have any questions for Mrs. O'Brien regarding her report? Did Mrs. O'Brien have any comment that she needed to share? None at all. Thank you, Mrs. O'Brien. Director reports. Um, again, Ms. Brower's on vacation. Did anyone have any questions for Mr. Kovarubias? And Mr. Kovarubias, did you have any comments that you needed to share? No, ma'am. Thank you. Board comments, do any board members have any comments that they wish to share publicly? All right, committee reports. Did anyone have any questions for any of the committee chairs? Okay, unfinished business, item 19A, consider approval of policy 8407 school resource officer program as presented. And again, please state your name prior to making any questions. Don't all fight over making the motion. <laughs> I'm sorry, I couldn't get my microphone on. Okay, um, Bobby Dupetke, I move that the Manila Board of Education approve modeling. Oh, I'm sorry, I'm on the wrong one. Um, approve the, the 8407 school resource program as presented. I have a motion by Mrs. Pecky. Do I have a second? Bruce Scheller, I'll second that motion. Okay, a second by Mr. Scheller. Any discussion? Kind of like to know where we're at on that right now. As um, far as you know, like meetings. 
Um, I need to schedule a meeting with the chief um, for you and uh, President Johnson and I to meet with him to work out um, details. Um, legal counsel is putting together um, the proposal that would be included at the annual meeting. And then it really, at that point, is up to the citizenry um, in terms of at the annual meeting uh, if they want to take up having an officer and um, and approve it. So, and then any actions after that would include what we discussed with the chief, what would be the job description, what would be the interview process, um, training, all of those elements would go into the conversation so that if the citizenry approves it at the annual meeting, we'd be able to move move ahead rather quickly um, with the next steps. I hope I answered your questions. If we still have to kind of go over the parameters of what we're looking for with the soon resource officer, or we supposedly have that done already. Um, no, nothing's done. At this point, we, we need a job description. We need the process for filling the vacancy. You know, what is the interview process going to look like? We need to write interview questions. Um, <clears throat> there's always training related to being a school resource officer. So who's paying for the training? Where will the training take place? Um, all of those, there are quite a long list of questions that have to be discussed and we haven't had that conversation yet because i know as i was driving in tonight i'm like thinking boy is this the uh, best year for this as <laughs> you don't know quite what it's all up in the air you're having school you're not having school you're, you're hoping to have school obviously but uh you know it's all up in the air It's a lot of work, but I think if we get together with the chief in the next month, I I think it's doable. If the citizens want this to happen, I I think it's doable. So can we review what what is this motion going to do? Just this would be um hold on. It works better if I present the screen. There we go. I'm showing it to you and then I realized I hadn't shared the screen. Sorry about that. Um, so this would actually be the policy that would guide having a school resource officer program. So it really is your first step to um, opening the doorway to have a school resource officer. First, you have to establish what that program would look like in your district. So that's what this policy does. So it's a first step just to get going on it, which means it would have to be approved at the annual meeting or nothing would happen, correct? You are correct. Thank you. You're welcome. Are there any other questions or any further discussion? Okay, hearing none, we will then vote by a roll call vote. Mr. Forbes? Aye. Mr. Holman? Aye. Mr. Seeger? Aye. Mr. Scheller? Aye. Mrs. Petke? Aye. Mr. Johnson? Aye. And it is an aye from Mrs. Johnson as well. Motion carries on a roll call vote. New business, I don't. 28. Consider Board of Education modeling face covering protocol in schools and at district sponsored events. Bruce Scheller, I move with the Mental Board of Education approved modeling face covering protocols in schools and district sponsored events. I have a motion by Mr. Scheller. Do I have a second? Mrs. Petke, I second that motion. Any discussion? Yeah. 
I, I think we have to discuss this a little bit further. I, th I know this is just consideration of it, but I think there's some other options there. I, I don't know how we can actually recommend. Are we recommending it or are we re requiring it? You know, that's that's where we need to draw that line. And what are we really asking? Is it just, you know, like when we're just in school stuff? I mean, if I'm out working at home and I come in contact with somebody, do I have to mask up? But I think we're more asking just around school activities, aren't we? Correct. It would be for in school. So if as a board member, you're attending an event in the school or you are at a district sponsored event. So for example, graduation last weekend. Um, that was part of the requirement of us being there. It would be things like, I don't know, Dr. Opper, if you have some some better examples. Um, you know, I, I think the rationale behind this is that we are going to request that our staff members wear masks. And as leaders, when you ask those that you lead to do something, that it's really nice if it's something that you're willing to do yourself. Russ Johnson here, is that also what the surrounding districts are doing? Um, I can't tell you um, statistically for sure because I didn't ask that question, but it is something across the state. Um, if you check that OSA news that I send out, you see um, districts here and there are modeling it. Some communities are now requiring it community-wide. Um, so it, it varies greatly. I've seen some boards that have uh, voted against it. I've seen some that have voted for it. And I've seen, um, according to the author news, some that are um, have very mixed feelings and had long conversations over it. Um, so it, I don't think there's any uh, major trend right now to answer your question, Russ, maybe to be more direct about it. I don't think there are any major trends. Um, it's just out there for you to consider as a group. Yeah, I I see a lot of a lot of the schools that you're posting about or sending out are either southern or bigger schools and stuff. And I've kind of looked around. I've talked to some other people from different areas, and uh, you know, even when I read the CDC stuff, I see that. There are suggestions, there are recommendations. You know, we're all we're basing all this kind of stuff on recommendations, not exact things. So, or hearsay or whatever it may be. I understand the safety and all that of everybody else, and I think we should be concerned about it, but the rates are so minimal and I don't know. I, I, I just have a, a little bit of a difficult time here, especially with the kids. You know, as far as more K through eight than high school, but I also think that we have to kind of look at the parent survey also, and that's a 75% that they would not, they would send their kids if no masks were required. I, I don't know how we can just walk away from that. It's 75%. But you have to look at what's the best uh, possible outcome for the kids and the staff. Um, you know, we're, we're looking at, you know, both aspects of it. Um, we need to keep the kids in the forefront and look at the whole picture. Uh, Mrs. Perry notes on the question of, of who's doing what. Clintonville, Clintonville voted to require masks of staff and students based on the county risk level last week. Um, we're, we're getting, I think, a little bit ahead of the, the, the first piece of the card here. Um, in this particular motion, you know, I, I think we're delving into what, what are we looking at as a, a whole as part of the reopening plan. In this particular motion, what we're asking is whether or not we feel it's appropriate for Board of Education members to wear a face covering when attending an event in the school or a district sponsored event. So it's only for the Board of Education members? At this particular motion, yes. 
Okay. Well, that's different than I, I misunderstood that question. Okay. You're, you're jumping to the next one, Mr. Speaker, when we talk about the reopening. Sorry. Sorry. Sorry, I was jumping ahead as well. Now, does this, does this mean that we would have to wear the mask at all times, or can we take it off if we're beyond the six foot social distancing? Or do we have to wear the mask all the time? Like if we're at a football game. Did you have some thoughts on that, Dr. Robert? Um, not particularly. I, I think you'd, you'd set your own expectations for how you want to handle it. Um, the CDC and uh, Wapaka County Department of Health do have recommendations for visitors and buildings. Um, and right now they would recommend as of today that um, staff, students, and visitors in buildings um, should be wearing some kind of face covering. So if you did visit our building today, you would need to put a face covering on um, whether or not you selected this or, or not um, based on their recommendation. So I don't know if that's helpful to you or not. So, we're voting to require the protocol, but it's a recommendation. I, I guess I misunderstood. I misunderstand that uh, a little bit. Okay, simplistically, what you would be voting on is whether or not, as a board member, when attending events in the pool or a district sponsored event, if you would be willing to wear a face covering. Okay. I, I personally would not like to see any special thing for the board members. I think they just should go along with whatever the staff and students are, are following. Why does the board have to be special? It's not being special per se. It's, it's the idea of, are we willing to do it when we're at a board event during this pandemic? Obviously when it's over, nobody's going to be doing this anymore. It's, it's gonna be a done deal. Um, you know, the, this came to policy and human resources because a lot of districts are asking that question as far as you know if, if we're asking our staff to do it are we willing to also do it when we attend events i know i kind of the leading by example thing it makes sense you know so that's where i'm kind of going with that one i guess that's probably the most simplistic way to put it Bruce. i guess that Do we have any further discussion or questions on it? Okay, then we will vote by roll call, Mr. Aye. Mr. Holman? Um, I abstain. Mr. Seeger? Nay. Mr. Scheller? All right. Mrs. Petke? Aye. Mr. Johnson? Nay. And I will vote aye. By roll call vote, we have one, two, three, four ayes, two nays, and one abstention. Motion carries. Item B, consider approval of the district school reopening plan as presented.
with some of the concerns brought up in the discussions we had after, um, would it be advantageous to let a classroom teacher require mask where someone else may not? Like we have someone with has four risk areas. I, it seems logical that she would not want to be exposed or he. And would it be possible for that teacher to say, okay, I would like all students to wear mask? Boardman and, Boardman and Clark as legal counsel has weighed in on this and um, they would suggest that as with any other school rule, a teacher can't require a rule in their classroom that the board doesn't endorse. So they would suggest that the teacher needs to be in line with the board approved plan. Who did you say? That would be Boardman and Clark, legal counsel. Okay, so my question is why can't we allow classroom teachers who would like all their students to wear masks do that as a protection for that staff member? The inconsistency isn't recommended by legal counsel. That would be one answer. Yes, I understand that, but losing a staff member to COVID wouldn't be that great either. I don't know what does someone else think. New London and Marion are going with face coverings required um, all the time. Yeah, well, I'll agree with Mr. Holman on that. I, I think that uh, we could, that would be something that I think we got to entertain a little bit as far as getting, you know, giving them an option. I understand the legality of it and everything, but this, this whole thing is something that nobody's ever dealt with. So obviously there's going to be difference and there's going to be different opinions and there's going to be a lot of different things. And I don't think, again, going back to the 75% of parents, I mean, this is why we did a parent survey. I mean, this is what it's the kids and it's a parent. I know for a fact these kids are talking to their parents and this is how they came up with their answers. I mean, they didn't just make this stuff up. And I understand the safety of the teachers and how they feel, but you're just no matter what, you're it doesn't matter what it is. What topic you're on, there's always gonna be disagreements. I, I, I think we can try to make some differences for different teachers and you know work it out like that. I, I don't think we can just go forward saying no. This is the answer. You're all wearing masks. I, I don't think that's the right thing to do here. Are there better masks on the market that maybe teachers might be willing to wear that are offered aside from what the um, school is offering? Um, we have some disposable. Um, the most frequently requested item is the face shield. Um, and and now that they've seen the type with the gator net, that seems to be um, more popular. Well, I work in healthcare. I'm better. Sorry. Oh, I work in healthcare. We are required the minute you step on the premises, you need to have a mask on. Um, am I the loving it? No. But is it a great reason for protecting myself, protecting my family, protecting, I work with um, the elderly, so protecting them. Um, we don't know all the answers, but I think if we have to do what's right to protect the teachers, protect the students, protect the parents, the grandparents, um, I guess that's why I think that the face coverings are needed. 
So right now the policy does not include face coverings at all times, correct? Are you saying they should be at all times? Or am I missing something? I think so. Well, you think I'm missing something or you think they should have feel? <laughs> no, I think that they should have the face coverings at all times. It's all day long. Like I said, I'm not as crazy about wearing them as anybody else. But if you look at the entire picture, you look at the health and safety of the students, of the teachers, like I said, the parents, the grandparents, everybody. I just think that is the way we need to be looking at this. Just to get some clarification, Dr. Rapper, the situational masking really comes about more as kind of a compromise. Is that a correct way to phrase that? Um, you could look at it that way. Um, Shyocton first used the term situational masking regionally, uh, that we became aware of it and that's what they're using. And so um, Clintonville adopted the same uh, model at their district. So it does allow for when you are six feet socially distanced and in your own workspace, like a student at their desk, they could take it off. But if they're asked to work with a group of students or if the teacher approaches to come and provide support, Mrs. Zobler gave an example of that as did um, a couple of the other teachers about when they come over, then the math would need to go on while they're in close proximity because we know that um, close contact per the Wapaka County Department of Health, which is using CDC recommendations is um, 15 minutes inside of the six foot distancing and that's with or without a mask and it's cumulative over a 24 hour period. So that's 15 minutes over. So it it could be I approach a child, I'm there for two minutes. I step away. Later in the day, I come back for five minutes. You add up each of those minutes and um, you're trying to be under 15 minutes in a 24 hour period. I think what some of the teachers, a point they may have been trying to make is their level of engagement is more frequent than that. Um, and it depends on the classroom, the type of work you're doing, but also you probably would observe that teachers that work with younger children probably are moving into their space and interacting with them more dynamically all throughout the day as well. So each student should have a mask with them in case they get within the six feet social distancing that they should put the mask on. Is that correct? The, the proposal from the principals was that um, as students are coming in now, they'll be entering through the vestibules that will have baskets of, of free masks um, available for anybody who doesn't have one. And they put it on and they wear it until they get to their private workspace in their classroom. Um, so each then, student will have a mask with them. Yes. They're wearing they could, it, but they're not wearing it. They could bring one from home. So it, it can be any preferred style as long as it fits the CDC bill. It covers the nose, covers the mouth, and no air gaps. So the student could bring their own that the parent has provided if they have a preferred method or style. And then I think you had something else, Dan. I was just saying, so the teacher would feel safe if she got close within a, a reasonable distance from a student that they would put their mask on if they didn't have it on, correct? Mm -hmm. Correct, but <clears throat> some of the rooms, I guess, aren't big enough to accommodate for social distancing. So it would re require that student to wear a mask the entire day, if, say that's their homeroom. Do we know that for sure? 
um, well the, that that the rooms the are the rooms are small that they can't social distance in other words yeah. their desks can't be six feet apart Dan and Danny were looking into that um, and I will have the, them confirm when they're back from vacation um, but they were getting dimensions of classrooms and looking at different types of furniture we may have to swap out furniture in order to get the six foot distancing. Um, in some of Dan's instances, he was talking about the class might meet in a larger room to provide more space. Um, like choir and band need 10, foot, 10 feet of distance because of projecting uh, when you sing those type, types of examples. So he was looking at using other spaces and then having to sanitize between use of that space as a suggestion. So if a teacher is struggling with the, you know, your class has struggled to stay six feet, they could kind of recommend their classroom. We need to keep our masks on because as I move around, you know, particles are always moving. So, so you could kind of recommend it. So that kind of creates a gray area, I guess I'm saying. Yeah, that's kind of what I'm getting out of it too. Um, the other thing is if, if these kids are in this homeroom the whole time and it's too small for that, then that group of kids are gonna have to wear masks the entire day. And the next group or a smaller class will not if they can, social distance so I, I don't there's there's too many uh <clears throat> differences here as far as there's too many things up in the air i think to uh really make an educated decision as far as mass or no mass you know depending on room sizes and all that we need i think we need some more information what did they call it again from the triactin situational mm -hmm. And Clintonville went with the same thing. I sent that to you a bit earlier today. Clintonville calls it situational face covering slash math requirements. Dr. Robert, can you speak to the liability issues that the school district faces if we do not follow what would be considered best practices and best advice from County health officials. So in talking with the legal counsel, both our own and we talk to at our state organization, we hear from other uh, legal counsel used by other um, districts in Wisconsin. Uh, what they're indicating is that if you're Health, county health department, medical advisor, um, in this case that also affirms the CDC decisions, if they're all making a recommendation that they believe is in the best interest of the health and safety of the students and the staff, and we would choose we meaning the district, I'm speaking not just individual, as a district, the decision is not to take the advice given by the people that you hold as your medical advisor, then we would be liable if anyone were to sue, but also, um, what we hear from the liability carrier, and Mrs. O'Brien brought this idea forward earlier, um, sometimes it isn't the individual that brings the civil suit. Sometimes it's the insurance carrier. Let's say that you're in the intensive care unit for 20 days. The insurance, health insurance carrier uh, might go after um, the district or other entity um, for the for the damages. Um, 
it's predicted that if we don't follow the recommendations as provided by the county health department and our medical advisor, that we would have a difficult time making a case that we weren't um, negligent in that instance, since we had been provided advice, um, but chose not to take it or chose not to act on it. Uh, so Boardman and Clark spoke extensively on that topic about a week ago as well. Um, th that's what I know at this time. I can always um, have our legal counsel put something um, more extensive in writing if you prefer. I, th I think that would be good. So it's in writing and we can see it because we're kind of we can have our, I guess we can have our opinions, but we're kind of pushed into a corner then at that point, but. So uh, the proposal. Go ahead, Mr. Norman. The proposal that we're voting on, it, does that follow the suggested guidelines pretty closely? The situational masking that we described, we didn't use the word situational, but what we described is what um, is similar to Shyocton and Clintonville are doing. And it seemed to meet legal, legal counsel. Um, Wapaka County DHS was able to stand behind that. Our medical advisor did not find a problem with that as long as we were respectful of the six foot distancing. We need to change the motion a little bit, to, or doesn't the wording change what we are doing? Um, that slide wouldn't change, and, or I could change it right now if you want the word situational in it. It sounds like that's about what they're recommending right now rather than the requiring, but uh, and it, who knows, it might change. In, a week, couple weeks anyway, who knows, but. Yeah, and I think if that time comes, I mean, we just have to be available for another board meeting and just keep going as it changes. I, w I would think if you had a very susceptible staff member, if they wore their mask, theoretically that would protect them, wouldn't it? From what I understand. Um, the research is the opposite. Yep. 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 You, if you're wearing a mask, you're doing it for those around you. You're preventing the particulates you're breathing out from being exposed to the other people. So the students are wearing the masks to protect the other students that they're working with or their teacher. Yes, I understand that, but if it keeps the virus inside the mask, it should also, a mask should also keep it outside. They're it's saying like these that. particulates are too small and frequently might pass through the mask. So the double but, barrier is what uh, apparently protects both parties. So, could, so rest, um, could, I'm sorry, go ahead. So what research has been done thus far, it does provide some protection, but the best protection is when both parties are wearing a mask when it comes to cloth face coverings because it's keeping those droplets each to themselves. So while some droplets yeah, so through that mask, if you're both wearing a mask, it does reduce it further because now you have two separate barriers as opposed to just one. But we're not requiring students wear their masks unless it gets within six feet, correct? Yeah. That's how, that's how far the CDC indicates currently that particulates travel around you when you're just doing normal talking or normal activities. <clears throat> um, 
if the staff member that has some health conditions wears a mask and a face shield, wouldn't that be the same thing as two people up a double barrier? Um, the face shield is for your eyes, um, keeping particulates out of mucous membrane. Um, so it's keeping the particulates out of your eyes. Um, so people that wear contacts like I do, we could wear a mask and goggles, or I could wear my regular eyeglasses and that provides some protection. Or right. a face shield is, you know, a, a larger barrier, but it's to keep things out of the eye, as I understand it. I don't know, the survey showed that we had a lot of parents that feel the mask is not necessary, but we have staff members who are very concerned. I, I almost think the situational distancing and mask wearing might solve both problems. As, as good as we're going to get. Other than saying everybody wears a mask all the time, but there would be a lot of people opposed to that. And that's what's being proposed, correct? The situational Always mask? Situational. Um, did you want me, for the sake of clarity, to put that in um, the slideshow? I would say yes. Please. Yes. So I'll start. Okay. I'll, how does that look? Are, you're able to see my screen, right? Yes. Yes. Mm -hmm. So I made that the first bullet point. Then when you're not six feet apart, but you can take it off when you're in your own workspace. And now I see that. Let me just get that back on the screen. This is too large. So it does say all the time when physical distancing of six feet cannot be maintained. Mm -hmm. Which is the same. That's the definition of situational. Correct. So they will be wearing masks if they're um, within six feet. Right. That would be situational. Right. Right. Exactly. I'm just you're correct so for little kids that's projects or maker space they get in groups of two or four and do a project together um i'm trying to think with older students um i know they do some co-writing in in english class they they might check each other's work and then have conversation about it. I've also seen that in social studies where they pair up and do something. Um, certainly if we're doing a lab around the, the science lab station, that might be a time. So those are the kinds of situations where kids might be coming together into smaller groups and mm -hmm. need to get closer together because they're working with the same material sometimes. And does this policy go 4K through 12? Or do the younger kids have something else? Um, right now, we didn't differentiate. Um, most districts are doing it 4K through 12. The only time we had um, children under the age of two shouldn't wear masks. And some of our students with special health needs will get something from their doctor, they'll have a health plan, and they might need to wear a different sort of barrier that might be more suitable. There you might be thinking about a student with um, autism, uh, where they have sensory issues and like having something touching their skin can sometimes be a problem. We have a few students with asthma and um, other breathing issues, um, 
heart problems where they may, might have to have exceptions. Some of those students, given how serious their health conditions are, um, their parents might in fact choose the synchronous at home option. I've heard a couple parents are thinking about the at home option because school just isn't gonna be safe or maybe not safe enough would be a better way to phrase it. So Mr. Seeger, how do you yeah. feel about the situational face covering? <laughs> as long as it, uh, is there anything in here that, and I think there may be uh, that, that changes this depending on risk level. Will we still, even if we're low risk, will we still be at a six foot distance or is this something that we can bring back to the table at that time? We figured um, when we talked to the Department of Health Services this morning and superintendents, we asked when we get to low, that's almost like last school year but that would be a very dramatic change in the number of cases as well. So it would take we a lot of Sorry, Sorry, go ahead. I'm done. <laughs> Can we also talk a little bit about um, students passing in the hallway and the requirement? About what, in the what in the hallways? When passing. students are passing each other in the hallway. I thought they had to wear a mask in the hallway. I just want that to be clear so that everyone understands that. Yeah, that, that I realize and I understand. Um, when they're going from classroom to classroom, I think it's gonna be, it sounded like it was gonna be in pods or cohorts or whatever. Um, so maybe, you know, I guess you gotta, do we put it in there that no matter what, when they're moving down the hallway, they have to wear masks? And I understand that. That's only like a couple seconds or minute minute time in their uh, day that they have to have it on the whole time. So I, I get those little things. That's okay. I mean, I'm not against that. But um, give them a little bit of, uh, they just need that leeway in the classroom to, to take it off, breathe, do what they need to, you know, just relax. Otherwise it's, it's tough. Uh, do, and do we need to put something in here that we could um, reevaluate or whatever if we go to a lower level? So we can change it or, you know, follow whatever the directives are from the health people? Actually, um, I think you have that in here, but you can confirm if you read it that way. But that was the purpose of the three colored chart that if the risk level change, then really the whole plan changes. Um, you have a lot more freedoms um, if we move into that low risk range. It actually starts to look like what a lot of people have asked for, um, the, the old normal. So if we did move into the low risk, would we have to redo this or what would happen? We'd probably continue conversations. I suspect every month we'll probably be having conversations, just checking in on status. And well, if anything were to happen, you get information from me day of, you know, when we have some kind of a situation. So if there were an identified case in the school, while we have to protect um, confidentiality through HIPAA, I would be able to tell you that we have an active case. I wouldn't be able to say who or if it's a staff member or student, but I would be able to tell you that, that we're that our status had changed. So then at that time we would have to converse, I would assume. And yes, you can call um, a meeting at any point, a special board meeting and under COVID, you can call one now, I believe with, is it two hours notice? Or is it one hours notice? Something. 
usually it would be 24 hours, but um, given the pandemic, they shortened the time span to allow you to react more agilely if you needed to. I guess I would just like to make a statement on the other end of this is our teachers are going to be under a lot of stress with this. Um, I'm thinking of those K through fourth graders that they're going to have their mask on backwards and it's going to be interesting. So we got to, I feel we got to be supportive of our teachers and help them any way we can because this ain't going to be easy for them. And these kids are not going to learn with masks on like they do normally. I, I agree with you on that one. As far as, uh, yeah, and we, I know this probably doesn't have to be in here or whatever, but like, how are we going to deal with students not wearing masks? I mean, what if we have 20 kids in the office because they're not wearing masks? I, I, we got to think about all these things. Like, there's just so many different, I don't know. Oh, sneaky, sneaky. Generally speaking, our kids have been incredibly respectful, um, especially when our, our staff ask them to do something. So um, I, I've been really impressed with the students. Rarely do we find a situation where someone's openly defiant. And if people are feeling that strongly, my guess is they're probably going to choose um, either the synchronous or the blended learning option if they're that adamantly opposed um, to any type of face covering at any point in time. Okay. Hopefully we call a vote or anything of that order or in discussion? Well, you need to have a vote first because oh, um, we, we didn't motion before the... I was going to say that. I was going to say that too. <laughs> All right. I move Bruce Scheller. Oh, go ahead. I move that the Manor Board of Education approve the district school reopening plan as presented. I have a motion by Mr. Scheller. Do I have a second? I second it, Mr. Holman. A second by Mr. Holman. Further discussion. Again by roll call vote, Mr. Forbes. Aye. Mr. Holman? Aye. Mr. Seeger. Aye. Mr. Scheller. Aye. Mrs. Petke. Aye. Mr. Johnson. Aye. And this is aye from Mrs. Johnson as well. Motion carries on a roll call vote. Um, I will add, I think that this is probably the very least that we can do for our team staff to help them feel more comfortable as they move and navigate through this. Let's see. Um, as per policy 131.1 bylaws and policies, considerable of synchronous education policy. I can chime in a little bit. Um, this came out of actually one of Carmen's business managers uh, statewide meetings where uh, the question was posed, what would happen if during synchronous education, this is live real time video that students witnessed another student uh, behaving inappropriately? Um, now, we know that in the recorded version, we could edit out anything before sending it out to our students and families. But in the live version, not unlike sitting in the classroom, we occasionally do see students um, saying or doing something that's inappropriate. Um, so what this policy is about, and I still need to get a NEOLA number for it, would be um, indicating that students and, and or family members could not make a recording 
of what they are observing and uh, put that out um, on their own social media. It would not be for sharing. It's really getting after, again, um, handling that with confidence as they would if they were in person in the classroom. Um, as far as this, this is part of the in-class, like the AB, so they'll be in-class and they'll be at home learning, correct? And for the 4K through 8, the camera's going to be on basically all day. Okay, so if, if their parent or whoever, or if they're not feeling well or something, they can still in class as much as possible or watch it at a later time they could yes okay well oh, are we looking for a motion joanne yes i move that the manual board of education approved policy 0131.1 bylaws and guidelines to allow approval of the synchronized education policy to follow as a matter of unusual urgency as presented. And that was a motion by Mr. Johnson. Do I have a second? Mrs. Pecky, second. Any discussion? Okay, again, we will go by a roll call vote. Mr. Forbes? Aye. Mr. Holman? You're muted, Mr. Holman. Sorry about that. Aye. Mr. Seeger? Aye. Mr. Scheller? Aye. Mrs. Petke? Aye. Mr. Johnson? Aye. And Mrs. Johnson is an aye as well. Motion carries. Item D, consider approval of synchronous education, student accountability, and conduct policy. So to explain your first, the, the um, motion you just made allows you to approve a policy in one meeting rather than the usual two-month approach that it is in your bylaws. So you just gave yourself permission to approve this policy now in one meeting. So now, now this next motion is about actually approving the policy. Bruce Scheller, I move the Manor Board of Education approve the policy on synchronous education student accountability and conduct as presented. I have a motion by Mr. Scheller. Do I have a second? Luke Seeger, I second it. A second by Mr. Seeger. Any discussion? Okay, hearing none, Mr. Forbes. Aye. Mr. Holman? Aye. Mr. Seeger? Aye. Mr. Scheller? Aye. Mrs. Petke? Aye. Mr. Johnson? Aye. And it is an aye for Mrs. Johnson as well. Item E, consider approval of state standards as presented. Russ Johnson, I move that the Manual Board of Education approve the state standards as presented. I have a motion by Mr. Johnson. Do I have a second? Stand for a second. Second by Mr. Forbes. Any discussion? Hearing none, Mr. Forbes? Aye. Mr. Holman? Aye. Mr. Seeger? 
Aye. Mr. Scheller? Aye. Mrs. Petke? Aye. Mr. Johnson? Aye. And it is an aye for Mrs. Johnson as well. Motion carries. Item F, consider approval of curriculum map as presented. Bruce Scheller, I move that the Mano Board of Education approve the curriculum maps for geometry, algebra one, and advanced algebra as presented. I have a motion by Mr. Scheller. Do I have a second? Stand for a second. Second by Mr. Forbes. Any discussion? Hearing none, Mr. Forbes? Aye. Mr. Holman? Aye. Mr. Seeger? Aye. Mr. Scheller? Aye. Mrs. Petke? Aye. Mr. Johnson? Aye. And it is an aye for Mrs. Johnson as well. Motion carries. Item G, consider approval of the Manoa Elementary School Student Parent Handbook as presented. Stan Forbes, I move that the Manoa Board of Education approve the approval of the Manoa Elementary School Student Parent Handbook as presented. I have a motion by Mr. Forbes. Do I have a second? Mrs. Petke, second. Any discussion? Hearing none, Mr. Forbes? Aye. Mr. Holman? Aye. Mr. Seeger? Aye. Mr. Scheller? Aye. Mrs. Pecky? Aye. Mr. Johnson? Aye. And it is an aye for Mrs. Johnson as well. Motion carries. Item H, consider approval of the Manawa Middle School Student Parent Handbook. Mrs. Pecky, I move that the Manawa Board of Education approve the Manawa Middle School Student Parent Handbook as presented. I have a motion by Mrs. Pecky. Do I have a second? Luke, sec Luke Seeger, I second it. Any discussion? Hearing none, Mr. Forbes? Aye. Mr. Holman? Aye. Mr. Seeger? Aye. Mr. Scheller? Aye. Mrs. Petke? Aye. Mr. Johnson? Aye. And it is an aye for Mrs. Johnson as well. Motion carries. Item I, consider approval of the Little Wolf High School Student Parent Handbook as presented. Stan Forbes, I, I move that the Manor Board of Education consider approval of the Little Wolf High School Student Parent Handbook as presented. I have a motion by Ms. Forbes. Do I have a second? Russ Holman, second. Any discussion? Hearing none, Mr. Forbes? Aye. Mr. Holman? Aye. Mr. Seeger? Aye. Mr. Scheller? Aye. Mrs. Pecky? Aye. Mr. Johnson? Aye. And it is an aye for Mrs. Johnson as well. Motion carries. Item J, consider approval of allowing administration to amend handbooks in response to pandemic issues as dictates. There is no handout on that one. We can read it. Bruce Scheller, I move the Manor Board of Education approve allowing administration to amend handbooks in response to pandemic issues as needs dictate with prior notification of the Board of Education. I have a motion by Mr. Scheller. Do I have a second? 
Russ Holman, second. Any discussion? Yeah. yeah kind of. I don't know if, uh, I think we should, we should uh, continue. We, we need to get together on this when, uh, when time, when things arise. I want to, I personally would like to be a part of any amendments on the handbook because it has stuff to do with the pandemic. So, and I think that we are supposed to, should be a big part of that. I know. I believe that, I believe that part of this does include that the board will review it after with the option to approve or disapprove it. Is that correct, Dr. Opper? I, I think that would be helpful if you would like it that way to specifically put in that language, maybe a friendly amendment for the sake of clarity. Yeah, I would think it would be good to have that in there if necessary. I always let you know if anything's happening, but um, we could always call a special board meeting too. Um, President Johnson usually helps to make the decision if it's something that would require us to get together um, quickly, if it needs group discussion. If you change, Bruce Scheller, you're changing a handbook because it's usually got to be pretty something pretty major going on. Well, the bell schedule is in the handbook. So if you approve this bell schedule tonight and next week, Dan determines that as he's looking at the AB, that he needs to revise that schedule. Um, we either need to call a meeting if you prefer, or if you authorize that he can make that change and we'll alert you to it. And then if you disagree with, if there's anyone that disagrees with it, we've done that before, uh, then we call a meeting to go over it and, and have you officially either adopt it or decline it. That might be one of the most relevant examples because there were some changes made today that he's going to have some new tooling of schedules to do. It's kind of saying that it needs to be due to the pandemic, correct? Is that what this is kind of saying? Motion is saying? Um, that, that is what it's saying. And the reason is because things change so rapidly. I was changing the, the slideshow you viewed tonight um, this afternoon based on this morning's meeting with the Wapaka County Department of Health. So sometimes we don't get a lot of forewarning about things that are changing and need to change. And that allows us to be more agile. Although, if you don't mind being called to a meeting that's in one hour from now, you know, if if you're able to do that, that, I mean, it, I'm happy to do that. Whatever makes you feel comfortable with the decisions because these are ultimately your decisions. I think if, uh, if you send through your change to us and uh, it's something that we need to, uh, we believe that we need to have a meeting for then, then, we'll, then I think we can, we can go forward but it needs to be written in there that way. So Robert's rules would say someone would need to, I think Bruce, that means you could make a friendly amendment and revise your wording if you wish to do so. And then the person who seconded it. It does say in there, with prior notification of the Board of Education, which means that the Board of Education would be notified prior to those changes being made. Second, so 
that should kind of covers, well, you wouldn't need to do the friendly amendment then? That kind of covers that already? It's already written in there? Or is that does, does it cover it or do you feel that you need additional language? No, I see it now that prior notification. So I think we'd be good that way. Um, that gives us an option to send an email back and say that we want a meeting or not, I guess. Is there any other questions or further discussion? All right, once again, by roll call vote, Mr. Forbes. Aye. Mr. Holman. Aye. Mr. Seeger. Aye. Mr. Scheller. Aye. Mrs. Petke. Aye. Mr. Johnson. Aye. And it is an aye for Mrs. Johnson as well. Motion carries. Item K, consider approval of revised secondary lunch bell schedule for school year 2021 as presented. Russ Johnson here. I move that the Manual Board of Education approve the revised secondary lunch bell schedule for school year 2020-2021 as presented. I have a motion by Mr. Johnson. Do I have a second? I second. Luke Seeger, I second. Oh, sorry. <laughs> uh, I think it's Pet TV too. Any discussion? <laughs> All right, hearing none. Mr. Forbes. Aye. Mr. Holman. Aye. Mr. Seeger. Aye. Mr. Scheller. Aye. Mrs. Hetke? Aye. Mr. Johnson? Aye. And Mrs. Johnson is an aye as well. Motion carries. Item L, consider approval of not accepting foreign exchange students for school year 2021. Bruce Scheller, I move that the Manor Board of Education approve not accepting foreign exchange students for the school year 2020-2021. I have a motion by Mr. Scheller. Do I have a second? Dan Ford, Russ Mr. Johnson, I'll second that. A second by Mr. Johnson. Any discussion? Hearing none, Mr. Forbes? Aye. Mr. Holman? Aye. Mr. Seeger? Aye. Mr. Scheller? Aye. Aye. Mrs. Petke? Aye. Mr. Johnson? Aye. And it's an aye for Mrs. Johnson as well. Motion carries. Item M, consider approval of district and class fees for school year 2021 as presented. Just so you know, there are no changes to the class fees. They're staying at the same rate as they were last school year. Mrs. Petke, I move that the Manual Board of Education approve the district and class fees for the school year 2020 to 2021 as presented. I have a motion by Mrs. Petke. Do I have a second? Russ Holman, second. Second by Mr. Holman. Any discussion? Hearing none, Mr. Forbes? Aye. Mr. Holman? Aye. Mr. Seeger? Aye. Mr. Scheller? Aye. Mrs. Petke? Aye. Mr. Johnson? Aye. And it is an aye for Mrs. Johnson as well. Motion carries. Consider approval of student insurance as presented. Mrs. Peck, I move that the Manila Board of Education approve the student insurance recommendation as presented. I have a motion by Mrs. Peck. Do I have a second? Luke Seeger, I second. Second by Mr. Seeger. Any discussion? Okay, hearing none, Mr. Forbes? 
Aye. Mr. Holman? Aye. Mr. Seeger? Aye. Mr. Schellen? Aye. Mrs. Petke? Aye. Mr. Johnson? Aye. And it is an aye for Mrs. Johnson as well. Motion carries. Item O, consider approval of transfer to as presented. Bruce Scheller, I move that the Manoa Board of Education approve the recommended transfer to Fund 46 as presented. I have a motion by Mr. Scheller. Do I have a second? Mrs. Petke, second. Second by Mrs. Petke. Any discussion? Hearing none, Mr. Forbes? Aye. Mr. Holman? Aye. Mr. Seeger? Aye. Mr. Schellen? Aye. Mrs. Pecky? Aye. Mr. Johnson? Aye. And it is an aye from Mrs. Johnson as well. Motion carries. Item P, consider approval of handbook updates as presented. Mrs. Peck, I move that the Manila Board of Education approve the handbook updates for the Professional Educator Handbook, Support Staff Handbook, and Special Education Handbook as presented. I have a motion by Mrs. Peck. Do I have a second? Luke Seeger, I second. Second by Mr. Seeger. Any discussion? Hearing none, Mr. Forbes? Aye. Mr. Holman? Aye. Mr. Seeger? Aye. Mr. Scheller? Aye. Mrs. Petke? Aye. Mr. Johnson? Aye. And it is an aye for Mr. Johnson as well. Motion carried. Item Q, consider approval of annual district reading Specialist literacy report as per policy 2131.01. And that was her slideshow from earlier this evening for the sake of clarity. Bruce Scheller, I move that the Manor Board of Education approve the annual district reading specialist literacy report. As per policy 02131.01, reading instructional goals and assessment as presented. I have a motion by Mr. Scheller. Do I have a second? Russ Holman, I second. Second by Mr. Holman. Any discussion? Hearing none, Mr. Forbes? Aye. Mr. Holman? Aye. Mr. Seeger? Aye. Mr. Scheller? Aye. Mrs. Petke? Aye. Mr. Johnson? Aye. And it is an aye for Mrs. Johnson as well. Motion carried. Item R, discuss prior approval of Washington, D.C. student trip and consider travel issues moving forward. And we do have Mr. Bortle with us as well. Um, there is currently a, a trip planned, and um, I, I, the big question becomes, do we have any concerns? Um, how should we handle travel insurance? You'd like to speak to it, Mr. Bortle? Sure. Um, I, I guess I contacted doc, Dr. Opper. Uh, obviously, this is new times for us, so just wanting to know what protocol was. Uh, travel insurance is about $61 uh, per person. Uh, the problem with the travel insurance that, um, that we kind of have is you get 75% of your money back. Um, and with that 75% um, 
you the only way you're going to get 100% back is if you're sick. A pandemic does not fall under the sick category. Uh, that was one thing that they were adamant about. Um, so the $61 is for the insurance for that 75%. If right now, um, they talking to the company, they said they will reimburse all money that they can besides things like if they have bought tickets, you know, for the um, Holocaust, you know, museum and things like that. When you they buy the tickets, they can't get that money back. Um, currently, right now, there's about thirty five hundred dollars that's um, bought, you know, for buses and tickets, things like that. They said that they are sure they can talk to the company and get some of that reimbursed, but they don't know exactly how much. Um, they also said that if we would transfer to, you know, just the trip back one year, that that amount of there'd be a slight increase in cost just because busing and hotels and all that um, increase. So uh, I was going to, I'm going to send out the travel insurance uh, form at the beginning of the school year to everybody. Uh, it's an individually based thing. Um, the reality is, is right now, um, no one would be down very much money uh, either way because we haven't paid in a lot. I've asked the company to not purchase anything until I get back and talk. To um, so that way they don't go buy, you know, tickets to um, the archives and things like that. So um, February 15th is really the next date where it's about another $1,700 that they have to purchase. So that's where we're at. And I guess I just communicating is really the big thing. So at this point in time, when they, is your next parent? Uh, well, uh, I was going to have another one this fall, <laughs> but, um, you know, shortly after we get back to school, uh, we'd probably have to do it online, obviously with the current conditions. So we usually do one in the fall and one in the spring. So, um, the next payment that I'm supposed to send out is in September end of September. Um, it's a pretty good chunk of change, but once again, they, they said they'd reimburse um, anything they have not spent towards bookings. So <laughs> I just don't want, uh, you know, anyone coming back and saying, you know, that they, they lost money or anything like that. So I'm just trying to communicate with everybody. What, what would this do to your, say your next year's class if you postponed it one year? I'd go back to back years. I wouldn't take, I would still take the same two grades if we postponed it here. Uh, yep. Just be ninth graders and eighth graders at the time. I'm very leery about high school trips. Uh, but, uh, you know, I guess, and then I would, then the following year, I would take the next group of eighth grade and seventh grade. So we just go back to back years for the the one year or the one the one time period so we won't miss any grades or anything like that um yeah. and essentially that would actually not i'm not saying save you the most money but that would help you lose the least amount of money <laughs> correct um most likely i don't know what the cost of stuff is going to go up that's i guess would be the only you know the travel industry right now is in pretty tough shape so I don't know if they're going to try to make make it all back in one uh, in one year. So, right. um, you know, I even thought about do we do I postpone it and go in the fall with the one group, and then that way there's still, you know, and then go the, the a year and a half later in May just to get a little separation. But I guess right now we don't know about this the pandemic anyway, so where it's going. Yeah. Really just trying to keep everybody up to date. Um, and I'll continue to work with Dr. Opper and everybody about just trying to do what's best for the uh, students and the parents in our district. If they were considering, you know, just canceling a year, when would that come up? I would suggest uh, by February 15th. Oh, but everybody would have to pay out that first chunk 
But like you um, said, you get most of that back if you don't. What I would do is I would, uh, I've already talked to the company many times about um, delaying as many payments as, as possible and not have not having them spend the money. So we'd still send them the check, but they wouldn't purchase anything with it. That, But by us sending the check, it would hold, it would hold our spot, per se. But okay. at the same time, without them buying tickets, they technically wouldn't be spending any of our money. Thank you. That's all I got. So is it prudent maybe to um, just kind of reach out to the parents and, and maybe gauge a little bit what their comfort level is too? Yeah, that's that was all. I was going to wait till school got got back starting since really we don't have anything going on between now and then and then do the have the work with the middle school teachers of you know, having that communication with them. So, so that way everybody's, no one's caught off guard. And, you know, maybe they're all going to say they don't want to go, but I can tell you they're, the parents are still hitting up, hitting me up to sell chocolate to pay for the trip. So I know they're so interested in going. <laughs> all right. Thank you, Mr. Bortle. Thank you. All right. Next meeting dates. Um, schedule a tentative special board of education meeting next week for the purpose of reviewing and approving summer school 2020 staffing. So were we hoping maybe to piggyback off of another meeting, Dr. Opper? Um, we possibly could do that. Um, it looks to me like, um, p and is meeting on the 4th from 5.30 to 7. Um, Title IX legal pages is 2,000 pages long. The policies aren't that long, but um, you may want to go before rather than after on that one if you're looking for a recommendation. Um, there there isn't currently a Monday evening meeting. Um, Wednesday has curriculum from 6.30 to 7.30. I'm unable to make that one, though. Not that one. Okay. Um, that uh, we'll have summer school, then I'll be teaching under safety. So yeah. that'll have to be rescheduled. Is there a way that we can make that Tuesday work for everybody's schedule? I certainly could. It should be a brief meeting, correct? I mean, it's just a, what, probably in, a 15-minute Yes. In, in barring anything unforeseen coming up between now and then, you should be able to do it in five minutes. Are we you talking? Five o'clock on Tuesday. You can. I just probably won't be there because I'm taking off Monday and I got to work the other direction on Tuesday. So, but that's okay. I could call in too. Sure. So, what is this meeting for? To approve summer it's school. To, uh, yeah. to approve summer school. Staffing. Staffing. Yeah. Well, summer school is already going to be started, isn't it? Uh, we're a month in. Usually, you would have approved it in March or at the very latest April. The booklet goes out in May, and summer school starts in June. Um, you just haven't looked at the staffing booklet yet to approve it. But we are getting that for you. So that would be on Tuesday the 4th? Mm hmm At what, five o'clock? Would a five work for enough of us to make it work? Works for me. Maybe for me. It would work for me. Okay, uh, 5 p.m. then on the 4th for that one. Um, also on the 4th, it would be 5.30 for policy and human resources. The 5th is curriculum at 6.30. 17th is a regular board meeting at 7 o'clock. 
August 9th, buildings and grounds at 5.30. August 25th is the ad hoc recognition committee at 5, followed by finance committee on the 25th at 5.30. I am looking for a motion to adjourn these. Just a minute. The curriculum committee cannot be then unless you want to do it without me. I'm going to be teaching hunter safety. Can we move that? Is that we the end of the week? How about a week later? Um, I'm not available. My daughter's getting married. Okay. What about two weeks later? The 18th. That works. How about everybody else on the committee? I'm okay with it. Tuesday the 18th? That should be fine. What time? 6, 6.30 or 7. Prefer the later, Russ? I prefer later. But I'm somewhat... Either one. Pardon? Oh, no, what do you think, Lou? 6.30 fine or the one? Yeah, it, it, whatever you guys decide is fine with me. All right, let's do 6.30. Okay. Okay, so quick, then August 18th at 6.30. Yeah. Yep. Okay, looking for a motion. Bruce Scheller, so move. Okay, I have a motion by Mr. Scheller. Do I have a second? Press on and second. Any discussion? Hearing none, once again, by roll call vote, Mr. Forbes. Aye. Mr. Holman. Aye. Mr. Seeger. Aye. Mr. Keller. Aye. Mrs. Petke. Aye. Mr. Johnson. Aye. And it is an aye from Mrs. Johnson. The call motion carries at 1020 p.m. Thank you all, and thank you to all of our guests for joining us this evening as well. Have a good night, everyone. Good, good night. night. Thank you.